We up and running? Yeah. Okay. I got 6.30, call meeting to order. Sarah, if you can take roll call, please. Uh, early? Here. Hill? Here. Carbrecht? Here. Palmer? Here. Kendall? Here. Trudell? Here. Uh, Harder? Um, Ken did notify me that he had another obligation this evening. He may be coming late. He just didn't know when he might be done with that. So, <clears throat> all right. Carrie, you want to read us the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Debbie, do we have anything for public comment? No. Yeah. None there. Uh, we need to approve the minutes for the, consider approving the minutes for the September 18th regular meeting. I'll move to approve the minutes. Second. Motion by Sarah. Second by Chad. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Financial report. <clears throat> you take a look at your financial report, cash on hand as of September 1st, 2023, in the amount of $5,899,270. September receipts in the amount of $1,955,507. Bring your attention, it says state equalization aid, approximately $1.8 million. That's the first payment that's received then for the 23-24 school year. September disbursements in the amount of $5,926,871. Um, that's significantly more than normal. One of the things is uh, this is repayment of the 22-23 short-term borrowing. And the short-term borrowing was $3,854,629 of that amount. That leaves total cash on hand on October 1st, 2023, $1,927,905. Looking at October, the October disbursements in the amount of $778,404. October receipts, $2,922,551. And again, this includes cash flow borrowing received for the 23-24 school year in the amount of $2.9 and then cash on hand as of today, October 16, 2023, $4,072,052. So our short-term borrowing year over year was almost a million dollars less? Yes. Good. Yep. Any questions on that first page? Yeah, we're getting, as we, as we continue to have a greater operational capacity, we're going to borrow less. So. It's working well. Taking a look at the funds, Memorial Fund Fund 21 is broken into three different areas. First being the Veterans Memorial and changes in that account are $129 in interest. The annual contribution from the veterans and it leaves a balance of $31,298 and that's all held in the risk account. Scholarship Fund, $366 in donations and $695 in interest. There were no expenditures and then there's $170,682 in that account divided between risk and also a small amount in the bank. And then the final part of Fund 21, the activity fund, there was $30,217 in receipts and $20,066 in expenditures, leaving a balance of $287,475. Moving to service, debt service funds, 3839. <clears throat> We had $615 in interest, which is a balance of $141,623. And the Fund 41, a capital expansion fund, we had $587 in interest and a balance of $139,373. That's all held in the risk account. Fund 46, our capital improvement trust fund, we had $15,012 in interest. And the balance then is $3,549,186. And 
and that is held in risk as well as a small amount in the bank. Capital referendum fund 49, we had 42,926 in interest, leaving 35,338,208 in that account. And as you know, we're at the beginning of that building project, so that will continue to go down as we move further into the capital project. Mm -hmm. Fund 73 is our employment, uh, employee benefit trust fund. We had $5,291 in interest, $7,496 in expenditures, 1,715,828 is the balance, and it's currently all held at the bank. Kim's actually going to talk with you this evening about um, some options for investment for the dollars in that trust fund. Questions on the different fund balances? Okay. Well, in Ken's absence, I will go ahead and uh, make a motion for approval of expenses of payment for $5,124,489. Roll call vote. Motion by Brian. We need a second. <clears throat> I'll second. Just to validate, then that'll be for the checks as well as for the, the report. Okay, okay. Yes. Yeah. yes. Okay. Again, motion by Brian, second by Carrie. Any other discussion? Um, I do for Amazon credit. Is there a way that we can tell what is getting spent, saying the school supplies or just supplies? Because I see that it's. It's up there. Yeah, I would say that. So we're seeing a trend where we're using Amazon a lot more. Um, <clears throat> as far as the the schools using independent vendors, they will use Amazon to get what the vendor would normally get directly. Um, I guess I would like it more and find that same supply. What what's it for? You know, because if it's for FFA, it says FFA. It says nursing, and then it says nursing supplies. So if you find supplies, you know, what supplies are you? So what I can do is I can have Kim give you a call and she can walk you through that. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other discussion? Mm -hmm. uh, Sarah, when you're ready, if you can do a roll call, please. Sure. Hill? Yes. Yes. Carter. <clears throat> Hurley. Yes. Fulmer. Yes. Schindel. Yes. Hardwick. Yes. So I'm motion carried. Uh, reports and discussions. We have the uh, student representative report. Um, this is the October College Science Update. Um, first off, we have FBLA. FBLA has started our, their school year strong with their first major event, which was their ice cream social. They served ice cream during the Powder Puff football game during homecoming week to raise money for their chapter. They also held their first chapter meeting um, of the year on September 28th to inform their members about major events in the upcoming school year. FBLA volunteered at the O'Connell Falls Senior Center on October 10th, where they taught senior citizens how to use their cell phones. Very cool. Thanks. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then for NHS, so we, it has four pillars, leadership, service, and character, and scholarship. And I believe this month they were focusing on like the service pillar. So they've agreed to like break it down like month by month and focus on each one. So, and then for service is about like community service and the action of helping or doing work for someone. So then over the next four months, they're gonna highlight one pillar, as I said, and then they're gonna showcase their students as well, as you can see in the pictures. And then for homecoming, many of the members completed community service, spread cheer at senior centers, and then organizing spirit activities for the students. And then each year, members of NHS must complete a minimum of 25 hours to be inducted. And then if you know of any community service events, this can go to everyone as well. Um, please email Ms. Holtz, um, there's her email right there, and then we can get more opportunities to have more people inducted in NHS as well. 
Um, FFA had their fall leadership workshop. They had 14 Washington Middle School student members in the attendance and seven high school FFA members. In total, there was over 350 FFA members in attendance at the workshop. They also won the Spirit Award at the workshop and they had their World Theory Expo and they did Ratatouille for their homecoming float. Which was awesome. That was, right? yeah, <laughs> it was a hit. <laughs> And then for a drama club, the drama team competed at the district level in Tomahawk this past Saturday. And then we presented our one act, Andromeda's Galaxy, and then we have earned the honor of moving forward to our sectional level. And then that will be held November 1st and 2nd, and then Okama Falls High School will be hosting 14 <coughs> other schools in our PhD. And there will also be a community performance on November 10th. And then we also held a general meeting for all the new members to make plans for our school year as well. And then one event being planned is a Farm Bro Review, which is like a talent show for a community as well, which is sponsored by the Drama Club and Community Education. And then that is also scheduled for Thursday, November 9th in PAC. And that is it. Oh, and we have IQ. IQ hosted an informational meeting Friday, October 6th. They had 17 students interested in competing for their eight competition spots. They plan to create a shadow program where younger students learn the processes of completing assigned readings or to writing high cue study questions to preparing for competition. Much like a JV team, these students will develop the skills to be successful when it's their turn to compete. And then over in the right hand corner, they have the topics for this year. And that is all we have for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up, uh, district administrator's report. <clears throat> so take a look at monthly review. Um, as the students just shared, we really appreciate all the different activities that go along with homecoming. Uh, we received many positive comments, both internally and externally. We did receive some concerns as well, and we appreciate that because we're constantly trying to figure out how can we improve activities at homecoming. Um, we also had a wall of fame during this course this last month. Uh, the late Mr. Jerry Kaplan, uh, Jerry was represented by his son Michael and Mrs. Diane Kampke Nichols, were identified um, to be inducted into the Oconto Falls School District Wall of Fame. This honor is based on their outstanding civic achievements and professional success after high school. Their induction was based on the highest quality of service and leadership and the significant contributions to the communities that they've lived in. On that note, thank you to Mr. Jerry Monahan, Mr. Danny Smith, Mr. Stuart Russ, and Mrs. Donna Eckes for planning, coordinating, and conducting our Wall of Fame Class of 2023 induction. Nice job, we appreciate it. Uh, the City of Okano Falls is continuing to move forward with their plans for a TIF district. Uh, they did have the meeting on September 25th at City Hall. And as we've talked about, it's their plan to focus on redevelopment of the downtown. Uh, attracting business to the business district and focus on residential development to include potentially something with the Washington Middle School site in the future, depending on how things go. So I had a chance to attend that. That went well. Thank you to those who attended the groundbreaking ceremony back on the 27th of September. Um, Mrs. Stephanie Jeffers, Mrs. Debbie Woods, Mike Bushy, and members of the Nexus team worked together to plan and carry out that event. It was well attended. It was an opportunity for everyone to celebrate the milestone of the work uh, towards building a new middle school. So we appreciate it. I uh, wanted to make the board aware the literacy leadership team here in Oconto Falls is alive and well and doing a lot of work right now to plan for how to respond effectively to the Act 20 legislation. Uh, they'll be coming to you in the future with information on that and, and Heather Kang is will lead that effort. Um, ultimately, Act 20 legislation is focused on improving literacy outcomes for students in grades K through 3. And so one of the things that we're finding is the professional development that our staff has been involved in the last couple of years is aligning with much of this work. And so we appreciate the effort in the last couple of years as well as what we're going to do moving forward. Had a chance to attend the Abrams Grandparents Day. As you would imagine, this is an awesome event. Um, it's extremely well attended. I think it's only attended more um, for the holiday concerts. Uh, we are thoughtful of parking, but we have parking that goes way down past the school. 
uh, for all those who work together, our parents, community members, and staff to plan and conduct this event. We greatly appreciate it. The grandparents are appreciative of getting an opportunity to come in and interact with the grandchildren. Our fall athletic teams have been doing extremely well. Um, if you're not aware, volleyball team secured number two seed in our sectional is going to be hosting uh, Lakeland High School or Northland Pines High School this Thursday at 7 p.m. in our field house. And if we win that one, I should say when we win that one, um, we'll be playing them on Saturday. Uh, Northwoods Football Conference Championship Panthers are going to be hosting Somerset High School this Friday, October 20th, here at ST Paper Stadium. And our boys and girls cross-country team are going to be running sectionals on Saturday, August 21st, at Kobe High School. Uh, boys are running at 245 and girls at 345. So a lot of different positive activities that are going on with what the students shared as well as um, the information that I just shared, uh, there's a lot that goes into making those things happen. Um, we see the results, but those kids are practicing and involved in all types of development that we don't always see leading up to those events. Uh, also want to make you aware, um, our collaboration with School Perceptions is resulting in the 2023 staff survey, which has gone out to our team. Our intent is gain a better understanding of what's going well as where it is as much as where are we needing to improve. Um, this has gone out to all of our staff members. We're asking that all of them work together to take this. Uh, ultimately, we're hoping for 100% participation, and this needs to be completed by the 25th of October. So for the people that have already taken it, thank you. We really appreciate it. For folks who have not taken it yet, we encourage you to please do so because your feedback is something that we need for our efforts to improve. So I'm open to your questions, otherwise this completes my multiple. We gave them multiple options to be able to take that survey again. So via if they have the opportunity to take it electronically as the primary way, but if they would rather they can get a hard copy. Okay. Yeah. I think last year there was an ask of that, and I don't think anybody actually did the hard copy. I think it ended up goes like a hundred percent. I can't I can maybe one or two that did do Yeah. It. It ended up, it was a big thing of discussion, right. but it ended up, yeah, Not I, I thought it was actually zero, but maybe it was, was one or two, but yeah, that option is there. <coughs> so, so. What was the response rate last year, just to compare it to when we get the results this year? Yeah, I, don't know. I don't know off the top of my head. I can get that for you. Um, it's a lot better than what, so like if you work um, any type of research, they usually talk about anything over 15 or 20% is reasonable enough to believe your outcomes. Um, ours was way beyond that. I think it was, if I remember, in the 60s or 70%. Um, but I'm hoping to get more. Um, it's something that we, we give people enough time. Um, we're, it's about 10 minutes to take it, depending on how much you want to put for comments. It might be a little bit more than that or a little less. So we're trying to impress upon people that we use that information in how we plan to improve in the future. So. We still have those committees going on also where you're meeting with schools. I think it's different groups, different schools and different right individuals. Now, and groups. Right, right now we have, we have one that is people from each one of the schools. Yes. And it's like, a, um, it's a district wide committee sharing things that are going wrong, things that we need to work on. Okay. And then we're working together to try to establish that into building other goals and District level goals. Okay. Yeah. It's an advisory team. Okay. Okay. All right. Move on to uh, WASB State Education Convention. So, January 17th to the 19th is the state convention in Milwaukee. And usually, as a board, um, you try to identify who will be attending. Um, and then, based on who attends, based on who will represent the district. As part of the, they have a the, the, Thank you. As a delegate for the process of looking at information <clears throat> to go to the state to be thoughtful of for the future, how it affects public education. So, um, realize that it doesn't always work for people's um, professional work schedules, but if we can get folks to go, that would be great. Yeah, I'll just add, I mean, I, I went last year. Um, there's some really good breakout sessions, and uh, 
uh, you know, you probably know some of the people from some of the neighboring districts that go or you know, their administrators, et cetera. So it's a great time to, you know, spend going to the breakout sessions, interacting with Dean and, and others. Um, so I think, you know, over the course of anyone's tenure on the board, I'd encourage people to take advantage of it. It's, I think it's, I think it's worthwhile. I know Ken has, Ken has been probably multiple times and a lot of board members in the past have, have, has to have gone. So, um, I don't think it's something where all board members need to go necessarily, but I think, uh, you know, it'd be good to have a couple maybe consider it. So what is it? Do mind for knowing by? <clears throat> um, we have early board registration, but I have rooms already booked. I just have to back. I can always cancel them, but it's they they sell really fast, so I booked them right away, and then we can always back them out. So uh, tentatively looking, you can just reach out to me after. Yeah. They send person. out multiple reminders. Okay. You probably are getting them from too. So yeah. Okay. Them, so. I could, could have an opportunity. <laughs> All right, I think that's it. We're on to uh, old business uh, donations. We would ask the board to consider accepting the list of donations. And just want to say thanks to all of the donors. We appreciate that and the positive impact it has in our district. So Debbie, this this is seen online, right? On YouTube and everything. The video, the, the, this the list of donations. Yeah, the list. whatever you see now gets recorded as part of the video. Okay. Mm -hmm. a, I received a uh, call regarding um, us being a little bit more transparent in what we're seeing, and sometimes out in the public they're not seeing what we say. So we approve the donations, but we're not. They don't see what the donations are. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Yeah, whatever you see up on the screen, I'm watching live here as well, and they can see the same thing. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. I'll make a motion to accept the uh, donations. Thank you for everybody for donating. Yeah. Motion by Chad. <clears throat> oh, second. Is it Emily? Mm -hmm. Motion by Chad, second by Emily. Any other discussion? All in favor? I opposed. Motion carried. Thank you for the donations. Mm -hmm. All right, capital referendum update. So we have Brent here from Nexus to share information <coughs> relative to the bid tax that went out recently, as well as to give you the board kind of update on what's happening at the site for the last 30 days and the next 30 days. And we'll answer questions for them. Brent, we really appreciate you being here. All right, thanks for having me back. Just so uh, everybody knows, we appreciate you turning this around in the tight timeline. Sure. And yeah. there's a significant number of bids that. Can yeah, there was a lot to read, which is a, okay. it's a good problem to have. It's a good thing. Brent, I'll give you that. <clears throat> okay, so. Um, this is the one from last time. Or two, two times. That's the one from two times ago. Okay. It should be called. She has a has like it's a fit back number six. Okay. Okay. Can you just download it from your email, Debbie? I think you were in that email that we all got. Yeah, I have it downloaded, but I don't know if it's not showing up on my downloads here. 
That's from June, I think. I think that's six from June. Um, really helps when everyone's watching YouTube. Because right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I actually don't show it in my son. It did come through because I opened it up. It did? It did? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There you go. It had, it had the pictures of the progress. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. yep. Yep. That's there it. it. Yep. There. I was just thinking too, Brent. So there very well may be people out. Um, in the virtual world right now that don't know you, so if you want to introduce yourself sure. and kind of your position of Nexus. Sure. Um, yeah, so um, I'm Brent Warren mm -hmm. from Nexus Solutions, um, construction project manager. So um, part of the team of the whole Nexus um, team for the project. Um, I handle the construction portion um, from starting kind of from the beginning after the design is done, I handle the bidding, and then throughout the construction with Mike Railing, our site superintendent. So, Thank you for having me back again. Okay, so as Dean mentioned, um, topics for today are <clears throat> going through bid deck number six, which is the main portion of the new middle school project. As you remember, previously we've looked at the site and the, the sewer and the site improvements. Then we had bid deck five, which was the structural steel and the precast walls. And now we're on to bid deck six, which is basically the entirety of the rest of the project for the middle school. And then uh, we're gonna look at just some construction uh, progress updates from the work from bid back three to bid, bid back five that's going on currently. Um, so like I just said, bid back six includes um, the entire building envelope, which would be the roof and the walls, um, not the structural part, right? Bid back five was the steel that's gonna hold up the roof and the walls and the precast. This is be the rest of the the studs, the sheeting, the roofing membrane, all the trim, the paint, all that rest of the stuff that makes up the exterior of the building, along with all the building interior finishes, so the flooring, the painting, the ceilings, the lights, the cabinets, the doors, all the interior fit and finish of, makes up the rest of the building, and along with mechanical, electrical, plumbing, HVC, all, all those things that involve the, the you know remaining part of the building. Um, that's just a quick snapshot. There's a lot of pieces and parts of this bid, um, 21 different work scopes that we requested bids for is what we'll go through today. So on the screen, you can just see a snapshot of some of the paperwork that you all have in front of you. Um, so we're going to start with um, the paper on the left with all the yellow highlighting. So this is a recap of all the bids that we received. So um, it's four pages long. So we received, we, we requested bids on 21 different scopes of work. As you can remember in, in the earlier bid packs, we've talked about how you know we get different bids on different scopes of work. This time it was broken down into 21 different sections. So we'll go through each section. Um, so the first one was concrete slabs. Um, so in the bid pack three, we, we got bids for the concrete footings and foundation. That's like the underground part that's in, in right on, dug into the, to the foundations. That's what that's going on now. Um, this bid pack for concrete just had the actual slab for the building. And then it also has, so it's a two-story building, so it has the concrete slab on grade that goes on the ground, and then it also has the concrete that goes on the metal deck to create the second stories. Um, so 
We got three bids on that, um, two individual bids, and then one bid from SMA that was combined with their WordScope 4 general contractor package. So basically what SMA was saying there is we, we only want to do the concrete if we get to do it along with the rest of the work for WordScope 4. So we had to take that in consideration as combined. So um, when looking at uh, so when looking at this concrete slab work, Millis flat work was a low bid. The SMA price combined with the WorkScope 4 price was higher than what we got with our other WorkScope 4 price and the, and the Millis flat work price. So that's why we're saying to go with the Millis flat work price for the concrete slab. So with that, <clears throat> IEI on the base bid is 537.7220. Mm -hmm. The Millis work is 524, 745. Yes. But then on alternated one, IEI is still higher. It's still higher. Right. It's 35,000 compared to 29,000. So even even higher they get if you add an alternate one. Yeah. yeah. And that's, I should maybe explain how to read this a little bit. So, yeah. So, base bid is the first column. First column is a name. Second column is me checking off that they identified we have four addendums out with this bid package. Next column is the base bid. Next three columns are our three alternates. So on this bid package, we had three alternate bids. Number one was to add the multi-purpose and the fitness room addition to the building, right? Number two was to add sliding glass doors between, I don't know what, all the classrooms, but a lot of the classrooms. And then the third one was an actual uh, possible cost savings to change the way some of the electrical conduit was run throughout the building. Um, and then the last thing is me checking off that they probably signed their bid document and there's some notes that I had in the last column. So as we go through this, we're gonna look at base bids and alternate bids. I'm gonna kind of explain this a little bit as we go through it, but um, as we talk about which contractors we're gonna select, there's gonna be some differences between if we just go with base bid or if we just go, or if we go with all the alternates, I'll kind of discuss that as we go through through with it. But um, so currently, so work scope one, Millis flat work is not affected by if we choose any of the alternates or not. We are proposing to go with the Millis flat work. Work scope two, masonry. We just received one bid on masonry um, from IEI general contractors. So they had a base bid of 1,108,713. They had an alternate number one for 93,200. Work scope three, um, we got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six bids in work scope three. Work scope three is roofing and uh, sheet metal and metal wall panels. You'll see a couple blank spaces under this work scope three. So um, a couple of these contractors submitted bids with just the roofing scope of work and not the roofing and the metal wall panels, which is not what this plan specified. So I have them blank because I'm considering them as incomplete bids. Um, so uh, we are recommending Northern Metal and Roofing as a low bid for the roofing and metal wall panels and sheet metal. Uh, work scope four, general trades. Um, three bids on general trades, IEI general contractor shear construction and SMA construction services. This one's uh, a little tricky here. So this is where we get into SMA is the low number on the base bid. But if we were to accept um, alternate one and two, which, uh, as we get through, I'm expecting we're going to accept those two alternates, and I'll explain to you when we get through that. If we're to accept alternate one and two, then IEI general contractors actually becomes the low price with all the combined um, three different numbers there, four and four different numbers. Okay. <clears throat> so, two different spots of highlighting there. SMA, we're recommending if we go with just the base bid. IEI, we're recommending if we go with alternates <clears throat> one and two. And I'll get to that as we get down to the end here. So should we be <clears throat> deciding right away so we don't lose track? I think we will. Yes. So we're going to go yeah, through so this I, again. So here's my plan. So here's my plan for this presentation. I'm just going to quickly run through all this as I have been. Then I'm going to show you where we're at budget-wise. Then we're going to talk about our decisions about the alternates. And then um, I don't know how we record it, but but I I will know based on which alternates we select. Which I, we can. This is the only one. This is the only one, so it's going to be fairly simple. Okay. Um, so we'll have to come back to this one after we decide which alternates we're going with. I guess. 
Work scope five, um, we have three bids, Ableton Lathing, H.J. Martin, <coughs> and Coley Drywall. Work scope five is steel studs, framing, exterior sheeting, and drywall. So this is uh, the outside, uh, basically the walls on the outside of the building that go on to the structural steel. It's the sheeting that goes on that, and it's also the interior walls and the drywall and the insulation on the inside of the building as well. Um, so H.J. Martin was a little bit at 1.494, 494. And then they had uh, the alternate price of 96,594 and alternate two of 17,570. Okay, we're on work scope six. Um, we have four, four bids on work scope six, which is aluminum windows, doors, frames, and glazing. Um, so this is like the front doors of the building. It's the, you know, all, all the windows, of all the aluminum frame windows, all the aluminum front doors. It's also um, interior mirrors, interior glass. Um, Basically, just your your glass and, and caulking and aluminum type frame systems. Um, so Corcoran glass and paint is the low bid at 481, 425. Just got a question on that one. Given mm -hmm. the, you know, relatively speaking, there's a fair amount of difference between um, some of those. I mean, how mm -hmm. how do you ensure that the first off, you know, are all of these? I'm assuming they're not all proposing the exact same brand of windows sure. etc or right. doors like right. how they, do you they ensure not, yeah. how do you ensure we're getting the right quality that we want to pay for that mm -hmm. may be worth paying versus simply the lowest price up sure. front so um it goes back to the design process so the architect created the spec book that has thousand pages of all these details right in the spec book it says that for let's take this one for example aluminum windows doors and frames it says in the spec book that there's probably four, maybe five different manufacturers that are considered of equal quality and up to the up to the snuff of what we expect good enough for the project. So in the book it says it says tube light, it says uh, conier, it says something else. So there's just a couple names that off the top of my head. Probably has four or five of them. So these different contractors uh, have relationships with different manufacturers, different vendors. Some of them might have contractual relationships that they can only sell certain vendors, mm -hmm. right? So we make sure that there's multiple in the spec book that they're allowed to choose and pick and choose different vendors. Uh, but we, the architects all predetermined that they're all up to snuff of what we expect is quality enough to be in the project. Okay, got it. Thank you. And, and that's a perfect point is like, I know that Corcoran Glass is planning on using tube light which is, I'm sure some of these other bidders might be having done, maybe, maybe we're planning using Conair or whatever because of their relationships with their vendors. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, work scope seven, terrazzo flooring, two bids on that. Um, Wisconsin terrazzo being a little bid, 165.500, and uh, alternate one for 14.550. Uh, work scope eight, epoxy flooring. Massey's uh, is a little bit at 77,925. Um, four bids on that one. Work scope nine, uh, acoustical ceilings. Three bids on this one. H.J. Uh, Martin and Son being a little bit at 310,772. Uh, work scope 10, tile. Um, this is like the hard tiles, like your ceramic tiles in the bathrooms and, and things like that. Um, Mako's commercial interiors, low bid out of the uh, five bids at 120,431. Uh, work scope 11, resilient flooring and carpeting. So resilient flooring is like the uh, VCT tile or the LVT planks that you see in a lot of places now. And then carpet is obviously carpet. Um, four bids on that one, H.J. Martin and Son at 245, or 245.240. Um, Really, really quick on this one, and we can discuss this later, but just um, I want to make sure we come back to this one because on the flooring for the tile, uh, we had Michael's commercial currently as a low bid. Mm -hmm. And doing the math on the flooring and carpet, it looks like Michael's is about $597 difference. So um, yeah, my, my thought process is yeah. it'd be nice to have the same people doing for the same company doing the flooring. So okay. there's something to consider when we come back to this, if we yeah. can maybe discuss that. Okay. Um, work scope 12, fire protection. Um, got seven bids on this one. Um, EGI mechanical, 
on being a parent role at $234,500. Um, plumbing, okay, plumbing I show blank. Um, plumbing we got three individual bids and then down in Workscope 14, which is HVAC, we got one combined bid. Um, Kirkman Mechanical bid a bid of combined plumbing and HVAC, and that ended up being <coughs> the lowest price between plumbing and HVAC. So, um, so we left plumbing blank, and for HVAC we got nine bids, one of them being the Kirkman Mechanical Plumbing and Mechanical Combined at 4,304,590, that being the um, lowest price, so that's the one we're recommending. So with that, we've got Kirkman <clears throat> at the base, but it's 4,304,590. Mm -hmm. Second one is 207,740. <clears throat> then you have Ricky Merrill, that is, the first bit is 3778. And their second bid is 230. The difference is 30,340. Why would we pick? I mean, there's because um, the Reek Merrill price is only HVAC, the Kirkman price is HVAC and plumbing to both. So we would have to, if we went with Reek Merrill, we'd have to also add one of the plumbing bins to it to get to all <coughs> scope of work. So you can see Kirkman Mechanical. Yeah, there. I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, right above that. Yeah. And then, yep. yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, Work scope 15 HVAC controls. Um, two bids on this one. This one uh, is one of them where we limited it to just these two bidders because uh, HVAC controls. Most companies are almost have some have quasi proprietary systems, um, so. We all, this is a typical thing we do on all of our products is we really limit the number of bidders for HVAC controls because we really want the certain types of systems that, that we want, basically, is for lack of a better term. Um, so automated comfort controls was the low bidder out of the two that we allowed to bid. Um, it's a nice positive here that automated comfort controls is also uh, in some of your other buildings. So there's a nice uh, continuity there for uh, the maintenance staff. So that was good to see that they were the low bidder. Um, work scope 16 electrical, got four bids on that one with Northern Electric being the low price at the 1,925,000. Um, work scope 17 wood and rubber athletic flooring. So this is for the wood floor that goes in the main, the new main gym. And then um, athletic flooring is in the addition of the, the fitness room and the multi-purpose room in that alternate edition. Um, so there's uh, some rubber flooring that goes in those two rooms. That's the athletic flooring. Basement rollers is the low bid at 143,445. Uh, athletic bleachers, this is for in the new main gym. Uh, two bids, uh, North Star Equipment being the low bid at 61,17. Um, athletic equipment, this is for the basketball hoops and the gym curtain dividers and the wall pads on the walls and the wrestling mat mover. Um, the wrestling mat mover happens to be uh, the main cost of the alternate bid for this one. That's because that goes in the uh, multi-purpose room. Um, so H&B Specialized Products is a low price at 88345. Uh, work scope 20, food service equipment. So this is all the new stuff for the new kitchen. Um, uh, three bids on that one. Fine Brothers being the little bit at 359,284. And then the last one, uh, Elevator. Uh, two bids on that one. Uh, Otis and Schindler. Schindler being the low price at 107,400. Um, a nice one on this one. My comment here is machineless room. So um, historically, architects have always designed buildings with like a like a mechanical room right next to the elevator um, because. Uh, the equipment, the pieces and parts, and the equipment that run the elevator always needed to be in this separate room. Um, recently, there's been advancements in elevator design, and and uh, some companies can now do it with all everything like being internally in the shaft and in the pit, and we don't need that other room anymore. So both of these companies are two companies that were able to do that. Um, so both of these bids are with machineless room elevators which means there's another room that just opens up in the building for storage or whatever we want to use it for instead of elevator equipment. So, okay, so 
all that boils down into our last two sheets. Okay, so since we have the two alternates to decide, what I'm showing here, the first sheet with the green highlighting is adding up all the numbers without considering any of the alternates. And then the second sheet is adding up the numbers considering the alternates that I took the liberty of guessing at what you're going to you possibly uh, decide to go with. Um, so the first sheet, so let's talk about budget now. Okay, so, um, so we got the $37 million total referendum budget, right? We've gone through bid packs one through five already, which were some stuff for the middle school, some stuff for the secure entry projects, right? The roofing project and the Abrams gym, all those things. Okay, so for just bid pack six, just these bids we looked at today, the budget we had planned on is 17 million, 764 and 590, okay? So if you add up all those, the low bidder of all the bids we just talked about, it adds up to 16 million, 486, 748 or 1,277,841 under budget. So that's awesome, right? This is the biggest chunk by far of this whole referendum. $1.2 million under budget is fantastic news. That's awesome. Biggest biggest risk factor of the whole referendum right here, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, now, we need to, now we need to talk about and decide we have the alternate bids. Knowing we are 1.2 million under budget just on this bid pack number six. Also, um, referendum in general, um, we here we were we were running very close to on schedule. If you remember from my last presentation about on budget versus over under budget. We were under we were 4%. 4, it was four thousand dollars. Four thousand, like right. yeah. amazingly close to perfectly on schedule, right? right. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, so basically, since we were almost perfectly on schedule the first five bins, now we're on the big six, and I'm saying we could be we could be one point two million under budget. We could be one point two million ahead of schedule uh, after bid pack six. Or we can decide to go ahead with some of these alternates, which um, if you look at the last page, the second sheet with the green highlighting, if so there's uh, there's three alternates, two are ads, one's a deduct. I don't really recommend going with the deduct since we don't really we're not literally in a position where we need to save the money. I don't recommend going with the deduct. It's a better product to go with the, the uh, full conduit system in the in the base bit. Debbie, I'm I'm so sorry, but can no, you no. um switch the screen so people who are I don't have oh, they don't have that one and oh, they okay. won't be able to see, so they're going to see it the same size you are there. Okay. So this will be presented on our web page once this is all divided out, and then we'll add it to our web page underneath the referendum, so all the bid results will okay. be there. Okay. No well. problem. Sorry, yep. Brent. So we can pick and choose between alternate one, two, and three. Which ones? Which ones y'all want to go with? Um, I took the liberty of adding in alternate one and two. Now, so alternate one is adding the fitness and multi-purpose room. Now, if you remember on bid pack three and five, I talked about we had costs included for those additional rooms, but we didn't go with them waiting for these numbers to decide, right? Okay. So for alternate one, we really have three prices we need to look at to, to fully go ahead with alternate number one. Mm -hmm. The cost from bid pack three, the cost from bid pack five, and the cost from bid pack six that we're looking at now. So, um, all right, and I just want to be clear that the there are alternates by the for the purpose of working the numbers and all of that in case we had to come to a decision where we had to back them out. Correct. But the board voted to keep them in, so okay. they are considered in scope. These are not add-ons. These are Correct. that decision was already made. Correct. They were they were we in the original budget. Right. They were in the original plan. Yep. We just created ourselves a possible baffle if we had bad news. Correct. Right. Okay. I just wanted to call, yep. call them. Yep. It's an excellent point. <clears throat> so the three prices for alternate number one from, from bid pack um, three, we had 70973 From bid pack five, we, have 80, we had 87644 From bid pack six, we have 838487 Okay. Alternate two to add the glass sliding doors of the classrooms is 145509 So if you say yes to those four items, 
That takes us from 1.2 million under budget to 89,013 under budget or almost and, right on. And that's still without using any interest. Yep. any interest. Correct. That is without that is without using any of the interest. Any money. interest yeah. gain. Yeah. Right. Okay. So no contingency funding is included in that. Yep. Correct. Yep. So we still have the original contingency from the original budget breakdown. And, and we have the interest that and the remaining bid package or packages equates to what some four million uh, roughly or so that's what's the exactly right. I got that at the end of the presentation. We'll skip around all the way back. So uh, yeah, remaining bid packs are the elementary school roofing, the high school roofing, and the Washington Middle School demo, which is approximately four million dollars or about eleven percent of the original thirty-seven million left to go. So we went from 90% risk to 11% risk today, basically. It's great. It's exciting news. Yeah, mm -hmm. really good news. I'm much more excited than my face is showing. <laughs> 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 well, I just think in a climate where things can, are continuing to come in over budget, this is just incredible. Yeah. And it just shows that yeah climate is maybe or the landscape is changing a little bit and it just goes to show that yep. at 89,000 that's pretty much a wash of what you guys right already estimated so right exactly. incredible. Yeah. that's a good point you know a uh, year year and a half ago whatever this process started the world was in a different place construction wise prices were up and down every day people were electricians would call and say my good my bid's good for two hours because the car was changing that much you know crazy stuff was going on now things have leveled off and you can see it here this is a proof to that here this is a proof to the whole process that you all went through with Russ and his team of design and let's budget. Let's tweak the design a little bit, we'll budget it again. You know, that's really proven here today that they're they're hitting the mark with the design and the budgets, and it's it's really a fantastic kind of proof in the pudding for that whole process. So so what do we have to make for any so, decisions? So I think the first, actions. So the first thing that Brent's going to want to know is, <clears throat> are you going to go with the alternates? Right. You want to decide which alternates we're going with, and then we want to go back to the bids and decide, does that change any of the bidders? Um, can you explain a little bit more about alternate one, where the first three? Yep. So alternate one. The first number, 70,973, yep. is from bid pack three, which was the site and foundations. Yep. So the 70,000 is for the excavator to dig more footings and for the concrete guy to pour more footings. Okay. Okay. The, then the second number, 87,644, is for the steel guy to do more steel because the building got bigger. Right. Okay. And then the 800,000 is these whole list of 21 bids for the fit, fit and finish of that extra rooms. So before we move further, I know there was some discussion on social media about um, referendum dollars and um, reallocating them to other wishes and wants in the community. So Dean, can you talk a little bit about um, how we need to stay to the what we agreed to in the referendum when we requested the referendum and how that was um, there were there was a list of things that we have to stick to. We can't reallocate funding for a different project from these referendum dollars. It's either use it for what we identified or pay down the debt. Am I saying that correctly? Well, the first thing I guess what I what I would pitch out there is we are in the very beginning of this capital project. So this is great news today. Um, I would I would caution the board to get too far down the path of social media thinking about what might happen a year or two down the road. So right now, we're in a situation where you potentially make a decision tonight relative to what alternates you want to accept. And again, Clint made a great point. That verbiage doesn't necessarily accurately represent the reality of the process. When you think of an alternate, you think of something that we're adding on. It was not that way. They were part of the original project but we planned as if this would be 
bad news mm -hmm. in that you didn't want to stop your whole project so you could potentially take things out of the project to get within budget. Mm -hmm. So from my perspective, and I think we're, you know, Brent made the comment, he's pretty confident where you're going to go with that decision because you now have the fiscal resource to move forward with the original plan to have those alternates, which were actually part of the original plan, mm -hmm. and move this process forward. As far as people, you know, wondering about the next step, well, how can these, you know, dollars that are maybe not needed for this project, how are they going to be potentially expended? Um, I don't think that we're anywhere near having that conversation yet because um, is it looking good like there'll be dollars available? It is looking that way, but I don't think we want to go down that road until we're further into this project because um, we need to gather more understanding of what's going to happen here. And then there's multiple conversations around um, we had dollars that were not actually part of the referendum, but they were part of interest earnings. Yes. Okay. And I would have to talk with Kim about the level of latitude of what we can use interest earnings for. So there's like three different pots here of, of resource. And we kind of we kind of touched on it a little bit a minute ago, but I'm not sure everybody caught what Brent said. There's actually contingency dollars built into the budget to begin with. And if my memory serves me, that's somewhere around $1.5 million of contingency for costs to fluctuate. And then there's the interest earning dollars that we are going to earn over the course of these two years. Mm -hmm. And then there's whatever we're at below the actual budget itself. So like right now, if you decide to go with the alternates, we talked about being 89,000 below budget. So you've got 89,000, you've got 1.5 million of contingency that who knows what of that will be left by the time you're done. Um, so we could ultimately, it's very conceivable right now that at the end of this project, we could be like right on budget, not any extra, not any, any over, but then you potentially have your interest earnings, which again, as we get closer to the end, we could be having conversations about what's the latitude of the board with those interest earning dollars. Here's another piece. So in this um, slide that he has shown, he's talking in there about Washington Middle School demo. It's another example that's kind of open-ended because we, we plan for the worst and we hope for the best. In planning for the worst, we put dollars into the budget as if we had to demo the entire building. We don't know yet if we're going to have to do that or not. If the district is able, let's say, to sell a portion of that building or the whole building, um, well, then you save the dollars that you had set aside for raising that building. So all of this kind of comes into your question. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe, I think we're going to find that we have a different level of latitude of how to potentially invest interest earnings versus how you invest dollars that were specific to the capital to the, project. Right, yeah, I guess that was my point is that, so there will be some, but the budget for the referendum is a budget for the project referendum. As it stands right yes. now, and as it stands right now, we're pretty much on budget. Yes. If you accept the, oh. the alternates. Yep. I think we I think we can do that just to solidify I, I, it's, it's arguably probably not needed but the fact that you know now numbers have come back we've got that and I think just to to show that so the recommendation right now would be to again accept as we had already expected or what we the board had, had made the decision to include the alternates in that those are going to stay in and then that alternate three we would not um we would not exercise alternate three was simply a cost savings measure correct and the recommendation would be to not do that in that particular one that's correct right okay so yeah 
Okay, to answer your question. Yes. <laughs> Oh, yeah. All right. Okay. On that note, I'm going to go ahead and make a motion to accept the original plan that has been um, proposed from the beginning. And in doing so, we would need to accept alternates one and two um, as presented by print. I will second that motion. Motion by Brian, second by Carrie. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, so now we need to step back and look at the couple of yeah, right. nuanced pieces in here, right? So, um, first, more disinformational nuance is. That means that for work scope four, we're going to be hiring IEI contractors. Right. Okay. And that's due to, again, that the combined price is like 3.121 million versus 3.135 all part right. change. So it effectively, when they're all additive. Right. Sticking with the yep. lowest, lowest combined total price for the scope we're going to award. Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And then um, discussion on work scope 11. Um, if there's a if we have appetite to have work scope 10 and 11 be done by the same contractor. Yeah, um, I, I would like to see that. And um, <clears throat> I guess the, the dollar difference was $597. And then when you look at the ultimate bid, um, there's a $557 difference. I mean, I know we're splitting hairs, but it basically washes itself out. And then um, I just think it'd be nice to have the floor and carpet and tile under the same contractor. Yep, I would agree. Is there a is there a reason that when you were reviewing this you went with other than just being five hundred dollars lower that you went with H J Martin and Son rather than Mappos? Yeah, just um, purely all four bids were equal in my opinion. You know, per per plan spec. H.J. Martin and Mako's are both Mako's are both companies I've worked with and are, have confidence in, so I just purely went by the lower price. Is it normal, I guess, to kind of have? It probably is just due to different flooring, different flooring types often have different and for different companies that support. Right, I, I don't see a problem with having two different companies because one is purely the hard tile and one is you know. It's not like two companies are laying the same material. There's there's three different materials we're talking about here, the carpet, the vinyl, and the hard tile. Bid pack 11 has the carpet and the vinyl, and bid pack 10 has the hard tile. So I, I don't, there's there's no no real overlap in my opinion, but I'm okay. here to do whatever you want. But um, do, the, do these particular um, flooring types tend to, or they conjoin each other? Um, they meet up for sure. They they meet up at thresholds, at doors and stuff for sure. Yeah. In my mind, that just makes sense to yeah. have the same people doing it. Yeah. 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 Just doing the math. I mean, if you look at the um, work scope 11 with the alternates in, the difference between the two, I think, is like $40. It's right. a $30. Right. Yeah. I, it's <laughs> like 30, I think it's $39. I did, the, I did the math about 10 times myself. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> but when you look at the um, at the tile, there is a fair discrepancy there. I'm just saying if you need it. Are you saying if we want HG Martin instead of? Uh, no, I'm saying if, you, if, if, if it was desirous to go with a continuity of go with Marco's mm -hmm. continuity of both. I'm saying that right if you were to combine all elements of work scope 10 and work scope 11, mm -hmm. Marco's would end up being $39 cheaper. No, oh, it's more than that. If the two, right. if the two work scopes are, are considered together. together. Yeah. I get what you're <clears throat> and we are hiring H or H. J. Martin and Son Goodwin other scopes. So 
Is that the, is that the same though? I thought it was just yeah, it's HG. the same company. Yeah, it's okay. the same company. They've been, it, on my, they've been on my five year old things. So. Got it. Because mm -hmm. I saw it was H.J. Martin, but it wasn't the sun. Oh, um, that's just my typing. Got right. it. I'm like, is this different or? You never know. Do you need a motion on that, Brent, to go with a, um, a particular? If we're going to change it. Um, so, yeah. so just again, from a pure flooring standpoint, just if we're only looking at flooring, you have the terrazzo flooring, mm -hmm. which neither one of those companies are involved there. Mm -hmm. The epoxy flooring, neither one's involved there. Mm -hmm. But then if you say tile, carpet, and the resilient flooring types, mm -hmm. if you do put those two together and you say, we're doing all that flooring through one company, mm -hmm. then it does clearly, mm -hmm. one does have an advantage there. Mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of how that goes. Terrazzo is like its own thing that, yeah. if you're a Terrazzo guy, you just do that. Epoxy is its own different thing, and then the tile resilient carpet. That's kind of like the there as a group of contractors as well. But normally do those things. Yeah. I just I don't know, my feeling is I like having one throw the choke on certain you know, certain packages. Um, but leave it up to them. Or for more discussion, or you want to do anything? Else? Or we make a motion to accept the bids as presented with the exception of um, work scope 11. Would that suffice? I, I, I think you could. I think another another way would be to, to suggest combining two um, mm -hmm. two bid packages to get or two of the work scopes together might be another and then the lowest bidder of those two combined of the two combined flooring which is which is my place which yeah. is my place yeah yes yeah. yeah so that, you wanted to make a motion i will make a motion <laughs> um to first combine work scope um 10 and 11 and to pick the lowest bid combined with those, which would be um, Mako's commercial interiors. Second. So 10 and 11. Boring. Okay. Motion by Emily, second by Brian. Chad, I know you made a comment before. He's staying already not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, got it. Interest. Okay. Um, why don't, uh, just well, um, given that, why don't we do uh, any other discussion on the topic? Mm -hmm. um, if you can do a roll call mm -hmm. on this one, please. Mm -hmm. uh, early. Interesting. Okay. Uh, Carrie? Yes. Sorry, I'm like having an issue here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Garbrecht. Yeah, uh, at the end. At the end, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> Palmer. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Schindel, yes. Trudell. Yes. Garbrecht. Yes. Okay. okay. Motion carried. Five all. So maybe we should have been clear about that thought process out loud. So when we combine scope 10 and 11, the combined bids together, um, Mako's was $14,000, about $14,000 less than um, H.J. Martin. So that's why we went with Mako's. We did a lot of math <laughs> on our papers here, and maybe we weren't real clear about that yeah. for the viewers at home. I wasn't texting. Was math on the fly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> doing, doing the math. <laughs> okay. All right. Any other? Okay. I, that's good for Vipex 6. Now I just have an update on middle school construction. Um, so just a question here. So we made a motion to accept the alternates. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
we made a motion to combine work scope 10 and 11 yes. and to take the lowest bid, which was Mako's. Mm -hmm. Do we need to make a motion to accept all of the other oh, yeah. bid packs? Yes. Okay. Sure. I'll make a motion to accept all the other bid packs. <laughs> I will second. <laughs> motion by Carrie, second by Emily. I'm say to accept all other good packages, bid. correct? Besides mm -hmm. 10 and 11, which is stated above. Got it. We need to vote on that as well. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Did okay. you vote on that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Okay. Floor is back to you. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So just quick update on what's happening at the middle school right now. Um, so as you're all fully aware, we started with uh, basically a cornfield. Um, pictures, just a couple snapshots of before we started. First thing we did was um, install some temporary driveways and some gravel for that for the construction work. Got the job trailer set and powered up. Um, got our temporary fences installed just for safety security. Um, got the job site kind of prepared for the work to start. Um, as Dean mentioned, we had a wonderful groundbreaking ceremony that was really well attended. Um, hope everybody had a good time and saved your eye and there were all that good stuff on that. Um, and then after that, we got to work. Um, started moving a whole lot of dirt. Um, if anybody's drove by, you can see there's a lot of, a lot of Corn stubble and grass and weeds are gone, and now we're moving dirt. Um, so uh, Peter's concrete that was doing the excavation jumped right on it right away, and um, they are doing really well. We've had some pretty good stroke of weather up until just recently, but uh, um, overall, earth moving is going going very well. Um, here's some more pictures of some pipes started to show up on site for deliveries. Um, the right picture is they have actually now begun. So um, for the earthwork process, the process was to strip off the topsoil, then do what we call mass grading, just get everything close to the to the final uh, elevation that it's going to be, and build the building pad and build the parking lot pad is kind of the two main things to start. Then they actually start digging the footings out of the pad that they built for the building. So this picture on the right is we've actually started digging down to actually start doing the footings for the building. Um, on the left is. Um, the concrete crew has started forming for the footings. And on the right um, is an aerial shot of, you can see, um, so this is looking back west. Um, we decided to start building the building from the south toward the north. So here in the right picture, you can see these are the footings dug and formed, not poured yet, but dug and formed for the south and west portions of the building. Here's some more pictures of, the right is more pictures of this is from just this afternoon. This is how far they are this afternoon. On the left is, uh, you can see the retention pond in the back has taken shape. So overall progress is going fantastic. Um, knock on wood, I would say probably two weeks ahead of schedule at this point. And subsoils. Well, they are going very well so far. We have not had anything that we've had to correct as of yet. Just out of curiosity, was your decision to start on that side because we were still making the decision on the alternate bids, which have been that was one of the factors, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and it's just kind of, uh, as Dean sat through some of our meetings of talking the way into the nuts and bolts, um, mm -hmm. uh, literally the nuts and bolts of a steel. One, one reason was for that decision of the alternate, which is on the north end of the building. Another reason is the way the steel contractor is going to fabricate it and deliver it on semis and all that kind of stuff. Mm. The pieces and parts broke down better for us to start from the south. And the south is the two-story part as well. So we want to get the two-story part up as soon as we can and get that enclosed um, as soon as we can for, for winter. So there's a lot of factors that went into it that kind of all dovetailed together and made perfect sense to go south to north. It's just amazing that every decision you make, there's a reason. <laughs> there's it. a lot that goes into it. I know it's a great tension for drainage. So that pond, where is all that water going? Because obviously people down kill the way they're going to get that water down there. So um, all the water from the site, from the roof, from the site, goes into the storm sewer system and goes to that retention pond. It is uh, sized appropriately for, I don't know, 
uh, civil engineers don't quote me this, but it's something like up to like a 30 year rain event or something, you know, 100, I don't know, 50 year rain event, 30 year event, something like that, right? Size to hold that much water. That's meant to then slowly let the water just release out of that pond um, so that the sediment can settle and all sediment can stay on your property. Um, and then it releases, I'm not sure off the top of my head, I'd have to look at the drawings, if it just releases into the lowlands behind slowly or right, that I think off the top of my head. But I don't, you know, all the civil design was done per all the DRM requirements, so okay. keeping everything on site per all those kinds. Because I know they're watching, so I, I, I sure. said yeah. I would want to ask this question. Sure. Yeah. 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 All of, and all the civil review has passed all the DNR questions and comments and you know, all that kind of review. So. Okay. Um, so oh, what's next? So um, coming up, so as you saw, we're starting to form the footings. We'll be starting pour concrete very soon on the footings and foundation for the building. Um, the gravel driveways and parking lots, um, they're, they're cut to what we call subgrade, which is like the dirt. Very soon we're gonna start bringing in gravel to start uh, firming up those parking lots and we're gonna use those to drive on for the construction as well. Um, within the next two weeks, the uh, contractor is gonna start doing the storm sewer and the sanitary sewer and the water main. They're gonna start first with the storm sewer. Um, again, decisions of all the pieces and parts, that helps when it rains. It, it, as soon as the storm sewer is in, that's the system that collects the rainwater and takes it to the pond. So if we can get that in first, it helps to keep the parking lot dry that we're using to park everything on and set everything on. So we're gonna do the storm sewer first. Um, that should be starting, like I said, in the next week or two. Um, then we'll do the sewer after that, the water main after that. Um, and then um, steel fabrication uh, drawings for steel fabrication are underway with the manufacturer and drawings for the precast walls are underway. Um, we would say within a month or so, though all those final details of all those um, engineers double checking all, the, all those shop drawings will be done and then they'll start actually cutting steel and, and pouring precast walls in the factory. So all that's on schedule and, and ready to be delivered later this winter or early spring. Just maybe curiosity, maybe um, uh, just curious on the answer. The, do you know what the, the parking lot uh, elevation difference is from, the, from County I? And have we, again, I'm sure this is just like civil engineers looked at other things. Yeah. You know, notice, noticeable when we were at the um, ground breaking, the incline coming out of the current, and I get I get oh. that it's right now where the job trailer is, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're coming up quite inclined, yeah. and, and I'm assuming we're, the road's going to be built up, the driveway coming out such that the you know parents, et cetera, are going to be at the same level when they come up as as county i are very close to yeah, it i'm assuming right? are coming up i, I don't know, know that off the top of my head okay. okay we can check i can check into that um, i do know the parking lot itself needs to get built up 16 18 inches with the stone and the asphalt and all that stuff it's got to come up that much yeah. yet um but I, I i don't know those elevations my thought was that just that the you know that the, the elevation gain to get up to there is sufficient such that cars aren't sitting at any sort of angle they should be you know pretty flat relative to county i i know the, the civil engineers took into account so anytime you develop a site like this it's a it's a it's a balancing game it's, and we literally call it balancing the site of use what what dirt you have so set things at an elevation so that you don't have to pay to bring more dirt in or you don't have to pay to get rid of dirt. I know they went through lengthy, you know, calculations on, okay, if the building's this high, that means we're gonna incur more costs mm -hmm. to bring dirt in. If we put the building this low, you know, all those different things, I know they went through all that exercise, but I, I don't know how, how that relates to the role that I can check. Okay, you follow what I'm, Absolutely. I'm suggesting. I'm not yeah. sure I am, so let me just make sure. So when, the, the elevation, so when this is done, the elevation, if I'm standing on the parking lot at Wakanda Falls Middle School, versus if I'm standing on County High, it's it's not about the elevation of the parking lot. It's about that it's there is an elevation. There, I'm sure there's going to be an elevation difference there. Absolutely, you have to take up that elevation difference at some point in time, either gradual up to County High, or you ramp it up sooner. So the and the issue was when I pulled out after the groundbreaking. And again, it's it's site prep, it's just groundbreaking, mm -hmm. but you're at a fairly decline relative to County I. 
So it's hard to see traffic coming yeah. at you. And like Chad, I drive an F-250, so I'm fairly elevated, but it still is, yeah, it, it's, it's hard, <laughs> it's hard to see, yeah. you know, so you want drivers to be comfortable making that exchange onto the, onto there, and you want to be at a grade high enough that you're not still gaining elevation as you get to County I. Right. So if you can take up that elevation sooner. Well, the reason I'm asking the question and seeking to understand is because I know that the, the design team was wanting to, and I think we're saying the same thing, like currently at O'Connell Falls Elementary, it's a pretty steep angle to get down off from Farm Road to the parking lot. And so here, here's the thing. It's very, it's very visual, though, because you're at elevation. Imagine you were coming out of that parking lot and getting onto Farm Road, coming the opposite direction. Right. Mm -hmm. So you're you're accelerating to the main road. So it's, it's, kind of a, it's better yeah. because you're you're driving down than if all of the flow of traffic came up to that intersection on an incline like this, deciding which way they're going to go. Mm -hmm. Is is the point? Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll figure it out with you later. All right. <laughs> I get it. I'm with you. Yeah, I get yeah, it. Yeah. I, I'm pretty confident those civil engineers did do calculations of um, sight lines and stuff, I, but but I, I'm I, sure I, they I, have. How just, perfect is it? I don't know. I yeah. Okay. So I know there was a lot of talk on County I about line of sight just for like pedestrian traffic and everything too. So I do remember us mm -hmm. talking a little bit about that in the design mm -hmm. meeting. So mm -hmm. I know it was discussed. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. Okay. So that's um, the other thing I just had was just to again look at just a reminder of our, our overall referendum milestone schedule. Um, we had the design for the middle school and the bidding for the middle school. We're pretty much right on track for that. And the construction of the middle school goes until summer of 2025. And then the secure entry projects are all done and completed. Then we have the roofing projects. We did the, Ab we did the Abrams roofing project already. We have the elementary and the high school roofing projects to go. Which will uh, design this uh, this winter and prepare to do summer of 2024. Brent, I've I've seen this a couple times. Mm -hmm. Do I need to be nervous at all about the commissioning September mm -hmm. October of 25? Like, is that just? It's, are we still like on on check to move in before the school year starts? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. So commissioning is like behind the scenes stuff, Got right? It. So we'll absolutely the goal is we're going to open school on the, on the right day in August or September 1st or whatever that yeah. day is. Um, commissioning is like, okay, uh, September 1st, it's not quite heating season yet. So sure. heating season comes on October 15th in a lot of school districts. So then we can actually start checking, is the heating system working the way it's supposed to because now it's actually cold outside and we have a load on the building and we can, so that's what commissioning is. Okay, thank yeah. you. Or, or commissioning is like, the lights are going to have programs, right? There's going to be, in every classroom, there's probably going to be three buttons where the teacher can turn off the front or turn off the back. You know, maybe maybe three of the lights aren't aren't programmed right. The teacher teacher might have to live in their classroom for a couple of weeks with they can't turn off the lights exactly the way they want, right? That's kind of the final tweaks and that's what commissioning is. Okay. Are we going to get the schedule so like I know and constructions like putting starts this day they're supposed to be completed this day. Mm -hmm. Are you going to give the board that same schedule so we can? Sure. Um, typically, I don't give that level to the board, but if you wanted, I can. I um, that, yes. um, so um, after tonight, we just hired 21 new contractors, right? right? So um, Mike and I will schedule a meeting in the next couple of weeks where we get all 21 of these contractors that are room, and for about five hours, we sit down and have, right. hash yeah. out those details. Yeah. Then we'll build a schedule and we can, we can provide that. Okay. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> And then one more question for you. I noticed that I was in, in Abrams and I still see the main entrance on that. Well, the signage? Yeah. And you guys were supposed to start doing some motor and it's still sitting there. Yep, we are working on that. We've had discussions with the principal to get the, how she wants that to be done and uh, we're we'll working on signs or getting made up. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? Thank you, Brent. I know this was the turnaround was, um, I mean, obviously achievable because you did it, but I 
just want to acknowledge that bids came in on Thursday, Friday. Thursday, two o'clock. Yeah. yeah. So, um, <coughs> well done on the preparation work. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks thank for you. all your Thank you. All right, Brent. Thanks, Brent. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the question. Yep. Um, <coughs> I see that we have uh, Jason and Tim here for the discussion. I wonder if we can bump them up to the yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. For sure. All right. So uh, we are into new business. Hmm. Which one is it? Now? <laughs> oh yeah, I'm trying to be into that. So we have uh, some appendix B options for you to consider, and one of them is related to ice fishing. And we have Tim Allen and Jason Ingram here this evening, um, ready to share some information with the board. So just a little bit of history. Uh, they came forward with a request to start an ice fishing club a year ago, and you all approved that. Um, they're going to give you a little bit of feedback on how that went, and now we're looking to make it an appendix B option. And so that would be one piece for you to consider, and then a uh, second piece is related to a couple options for geography and potential fishing options. So, gentlemen, take it away. Sure. Um, yeah, so just first, thanks for approving this last year. It was, uh, it was fun. We had uh, 30, 30 uh, students that joined on, and Probably more amazing, we had uh, about a five kid to one parent ratio of uh, helping parents that were out there. So that was really great. Um, they had fun. It was uh, just a lot of the tournaments around this this app, so they can kind of watch your leaderboard and just watching them trying to strategize, okay, we need to catch this fish or that. <laughs> so it was a lot, a lot of fun. Um, this year, it looks like a lot of freshmen have been talking about it too, so looking forward to that also. So, um, yeah, other than that, really what we, we wanted to get here in, in front of you, we sent some packets, you know, really two items. Um, one thing we, we noticed, uh, we, we got to team up with some other teams that were uh, been doing it for a while last year on some tournaments, and they would uh, get on in the bay quite a quite more often after they catch their bigger fish, so that's where they found themselves more competitive. So that was one of the items we, last year, we wanted to kind of keep it conservative and then then get our get our feet underneath us. So the um, the main thing we were looking to do was try to set a shoreline on the on the bay, like a, a certain sector that we could get out on. And uh, I think in your maps, I just drew in a rough, you know, it fluctuates in height every year, but it was a, roughly a five to seven foot depth uh, mm -hmm. limit out there along the west bay which is less susceptible from wind change, but not unheard of, but it's staying on the side of the wall, the side closer, closer to us here. And that was from uh, Marinette down to Green Bay, so that was really short. Um, so that was really the first one we wanted to get in front of you. Um, and there was actually a local tournament put on by Marinette. Yeah. So it was all through that WIFA where there would be all the rules and safety precautions still put in place. It wouldn't be our judgment yeah. only. So for those of us who weren't on the board last yeah. year, I just want to make sure I understand that um, it was decided that there's no fishing on Green Bay and no rivers. That's what we're talking about here. So you're just asking for approval that maybe we yeah, may adjust yeah. that. Yeah, we, we, we set our own boundaries of not going down the bay. That's what we proposed mm -hmm. as. And uh, I think actually our handbook had originally inland lakes and rivers. But um, aside from that, the tournament, uh, the state tournament this year will be on the backwaters of the Mississippi. So we should sure. bring that. Um, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. But yeah, you're correct. Bay access to the westerly shoreline of the bay for tournaments, and then uh, the Mississippi, whatever WIFA that organization puts forward as the state tournament. Okay. So I think it was to start conservative, see how the kids reacted, yeah. see how it went, and then expand from there. And my Youngest one was on the ice fishing team, and he had a lot of fun and <laughs> wants to find bigger fish. <laughs> so, <laughs> and honestly, we we don't even think about fishing the Ocado Marinette Fish River. It's mainly to be involved with the state tournament at the end of the year, mm -hmm. which is yeah. this year happens to be the cross. Last right. year was Shano, and they didn't even have it on Shano mm -hmm. because they didn't feel it was safe. So, right. yeah. this organization is, yeah. 
Yeah, they're on they're on top of it, been doing it for a while. They're pretty impressive with all the moving parts that they got. Okay. Now where do we need to handle that? This if we so you got a couple options. I guess what I would <laughs> propose is that you can split this out right now and have this discussion about approving this becoming appendix B. So that'd be one step. And then provided you approve that it's appendix B, then in, in talking with the fellas, they've asked that we break these two geography scenarios apart. So it's not one or the other. It can be one, the second, or both. Mm -hmm. Um, and one being having the access to the west shore of the bay, primarily into that, you know, seven feet ish in range, and then also the backwaters of the Mississippi, which they gave you some pictures. You know, we think of the Mississippi, we obviously think of the river. They showed pictures that it's really more like backwaters where there's not a significant current. Do we have to be specific like that, or can we just say? allow them to go under the WIFA approved sites. I mean, can we? That's at your discretion. So last year, we raised the state, right? We, we, we could. It's they got, we got yeah. canceled. Yeah. The, 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 right. The, the thing with the, <laughs> wherever WIFA um, allows the tournament, um, it, it gets a little, they, they have statewide tournaments also, which they say you can, fish on any body of water in the state, you know, for this tournament. And that's kind of that internet-based one. So it can get a little, um, it's not as simple as saying where they approve because okay. they say- You can pick anybody yeah. and fish so, it. Um, but I would say any any specific waters that are a, sanctioned by WIFA, plus that I would say the uh, West Shore of the Bay, I would probably, be the summary that we would carry forward. Okay. That we would expect would be carried forward. Okay. And the um, Mississippi. Well, that that's included in the the, the IFA tournament, though. So yeah. That, yeah, that, would, that would be yeah, specific. That would be the yeah. specific. Yeah. Specific. Yeah. Kind of to identify the bodies of water. So I think um yeah I'm ready to make a motion. So I would make a motion that we add this to Appendix B. And um, allow the latitude to um allow the teams to fish on any WIFA specific body of water and the bay. West Shore. West Shore yeah. the bay. West Shore. And the bay of the Mississippi. Or the Mississippi. Well, that would be included in the okay. WIFA gotcha. specific waters. Gotcha. Yep. Isn't that all one motion? Yes. Yeah. Second. Motion by Carrie. Second by Chad. To add uh, propose uh, change to Appendix B, as well as allow the uh, fishing team to compete at any of the bodies of water for the WIFA, as well as the West Shore of the Bay. All in favor, or any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks guys. Thank you very much. Good job. Thanks for moving us up. Thanks. Again, fillets are accepted by board members. <laughs> <laughs> While we're on Appendix B, there's a couple yep. other. Um, also looking at the high school is proposing a kindness committee. And then we're also looking at an adjustment to be more competitive market-wise with National Honor Society compensation. So 1882. Yeah, the old one. I just locked it on so you can see what was currently on there. So here we had, so I'll let me give a little bit more info. So you all had a situation here a few months back um, where Appendix B item changed pretty significantly. And the question was, you know, how how is that? And I think a lot of it has to do with who is in the role. 
And so you have someone that comes in, they build a program, and they're maybe involved in a lot of different things. And then maybe they leave and somebody else comes in and they're not as involved and years go by and the program kind of declines. And then somebody else comes in and they're wanting to build it back again. So whenever you have those changes, then there's a change in the compensation based on how many kids are involved and what type of activities and time they're investing. And so our current situation is we have somebody who's invested in really pushing forward more opportunities for National Honor Society. We've heard about that tonight with the students. And so that's the proposal that is being provided to you from high school administration. I can make a motion to um, move forward with the changes in Appendix B. I'll second. Motion by Carrie, second by Sarah. So the other um, fishing club one was already approved. So this would be to approve the National Honor Society recommendation and kindness and committee. Kindness committee. Yep. Right. <clears throat> Appendix B minus. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. All right, we're ready to go back up to the top of the new business. So we'll be back up to uh, consideration of investment strategy selection within the CISA 6 OPEB Trust. Hi. Hey. Hi. Okay. Um, the next couple topics are financials. So we're going to get into it a little bit here. That's it. Yep. Uh, so there's this presentation in your packet. I've been talking about this for a while. So we've taken um, all of our other funds um, outside of Fund 73 are limited in what they can be invested in. They can only be invested into state-mandated safe things like CDs, treasuries, and savings accounts. Um, however, we have Fund 73, which is a fiduciary fund and is not limited to those investments. So we can invest it. Um, similar to how you would invest your 401k. Um, back at the time when we created the OPEB trust that we have today with the retirees have their money in the post-employment health, health reimbursement arrangement, um, at that time we joined the Wisconsin OPEB trust. Um, so each month you see in the financials that you're given that the retirees are spending between seven and ten thousand dollars of this balance, and all the money right now is sitting in our BMO bank. So we have one point seven million. You just saw that in your thing. This is the September uh, bank statement. There, um, we're earning approximately three percent currently, and that's it's not that we're not earning any interest, but it's at the bank. So, but we can't lose it either. It's at the bank. So when we joined the Wisconsin OPEB Trust, it's managed by CISA 6 and PMA. And PMA has been a partner with us now for the last year, helping us um, investing our funds. So as of June 30th, 2023, there are 51 total active clients with over $131 million in these four different strategies. So the clients are all school districts. Um, you see there's 11 in the ultra conservative 15 in the conservative growth, the majority are in this 29 moderate growth, and there's one in the balanced growth, which is the riskiest of the four. So they go from least risky to the riskiest. There's $81 million in the moderate growth area. We could actually split and choose multiple different strategies if we want, but um, as we go through this, I'll just be recommending one. Here are the four different strategies that I just showed you on the prior screen. Boy, I can't really see that. The gray is cash and ultra short investment. So this is very non-risky like we're in today. And then green is fixed income, also less risky. And blue is equity. So you see as you go up the strategies, the more it's invested into the stock market. I did add then a slide with each of the different strategies. It gives a little blurb. There was also a prospectus sheet in your packet so you could read a little bit more about each one of the types of funds. 
uh, the ultra conservative since inception has uh, made 1% over that time, but over the last trailing year, it has been at like 2%. Now there was a period of time where it was losing money. So these funds can lose money just like your 401k can. So I just want to disclose that. The conservative growth uh, since inception has earned about 3% and the last year has been at 5.7%. The moderate growth since inception has earned 5%. The last year has been also around 5%. I'm here to see those numbers. And finally, the balanced growth, which is the riskiest since inception, has only earned 1.4%, but it hasn't been around uh, that long. So that isn't necessarily an indicator. Um, in the last year, it's earned 10%. So some of these have really taken off in the last, uh, I would say, six months. And prior to that, you know, we're doing just like the rest of the market work. So we really have three options. We can keep the money in the bank like we have today. We can take it and invest it in WISC, uh, where our other money is, and that's, again, in those safe investments. Or uh, we can put it into the OPEP trust and pick one of these four strategies. So my recommendation is that we put it into that moderate growth, the third one, where a lot of the other uh, clients are picking. We have this opportunity, and if you read the prospectus sheet, it says, you know, if your plan is to keep your money in there at least five years or more. And we have $1.7 million. We're spending between 100 and 200,000 per year. So that money can really earn and just, help itself over time and we're not going to have to take money out of our general fund and reinvest it in there. So um, we can earn more in the moderate growth uh, than our potential would be at WISC or the other places. This is our only opportunity to do that. But again, um, there is some risk with it. So how easy is it to change investment strategy if we get into something? Because if you look at this one that you're recommending the trailing trailing one year is like at 8.4 percent earnings but then this last quarter was at 3.5 so we're earning a little bit less well quite a bit less so if that <clears throat> if we get to six months from now in that quarterly interest earning is less than what we're earning at the bank can we switch it back yeah. What is the okay? So there's um, no there's no penalty. There's no. Uh, I would have to verify, but once it's in the trust, it's in the trust. The only way we can take it out, we can take it out and put it in the bank, but it has to stay within that. Like the district can't take it out and then put it back in the general fund or anything like sure, that. Sure, right, it has to stay the trust. That. Right, it has to stay yeah. titled that way. But we can take it out of this investment and put it back into what we have it in into right the now. bank. Yeah, right. Okay. Because at some point I'm going to have to take it out to spend it on the retiree stuff, so we can uh, move it back and forth as we see fit, or we decide, you know what, we don't like this, we want to go to ultra conservative. We can do that. Okay. And we can review this periodically. But I, I personally will be watching it. Uh, the information comes up quarterly. Okay. So we'll see it on the interest earnings, on the financials. Yeah. Okay. Are you comfortable with the fees? I, um, I, I didn't see anything in here on what the... I went to, I've been going to their <clears throat> quarterly update meetings, and this is a very low fee in, in relation to like what an individual would, would pay, but there are fees, yes. Okay. But they pride themselves on, on their low fees. Okay. I, I didn't see any concern with that. Okay. <clears throat> so if you feel like you need more time with this or you need more information we can come back otherwise uh, those um if we want to join the trust it would be moderate growth or we stay at the bank or with can you scroll back to her recommendation Yeah, the, the game, okay, the moderate. Yeah, it would be. The, it's the one that we were on. Okay. The moderate one. Okay. Yeah, I'll make a motion to follow Kim's recommendation with the moderate growth performance. 
Yep. So. Oh, one more breath. There you yeah. go. Oh, there it is. There it is. No, that's balanced. Go mm -hmm. one more. Other way. That's I'll make that motion right there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Second. <laughs> Motion by Brian, second by Chad, to follow the recommendation of using the moderate growth. Three. Three. Any other discussion? I would just say, I think when you look at the four options, like option three, like, you know, and four seem so risky because they're three and four, but these are very conservative <laughs> funds. I mean, I'm looking at there's very small small cap of stocks. Most of it is held in large cap stocks if it's in the stock market. Otherwise, we're in invest U.S. investment grade bonds. So I'm very comfortable um, with that recommendation as well. So I just want to mention. Okay. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thanks, Kim. Before we jump to the next one, I see Wally out there, and <laughs> Wally, Wally has a. Uh, questions for the board, and we've got him near the end. So I'm wondering if we can jump all the way up. We will jump down to the uh, out oh, on the last page out of state field trip. Well, really <laughs> Mr. Walter Taylor, <laughs> Mr. Walter Taylor, you have the floor. Wally, you would have um, been here till 10. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we're not that interested. Wally, <laughs> Wally's going to talk to you about an opportunity. I think it's happened to you go out of state on a trip. Yes. Yes. Bring on along. So our National FA Convention is held annually right now in, in Indianapolis, Indiana. And we're looking to uh, seek permission to attend that for just uh, three weeks from now. And we'd be traveling via coach with Lena Suring, Carney Nato in Michigan, Green Bay Southwest, and Green Bay Preble Schools. Uh, we have the opportunity to have seven seats uh, on that, uh, a joint, accompanying five students uh, another chaperone would be Ken Harder um, uh, with us, our alumni president. Uh, right now, the cost is set at $600, and Lena is coordinating that trip for us. Uh, we are looking at uh, extra funding coming through uh, from our FFA alumni to help with some of that uh, trip costs, along with uh, students earning that throughout our different fundraisers that we do with our fruit sale and our Memorial Weekend sale. Uh, so very doable uh, financial uh, thing for our students. Um, Couple of highlights. It was really fun reading through what uh, Bobby had sent to me for uh, what types of things will students be able to do while at this event. Um, besides leaving at 5 a.m. from Lena on Tuesday, October 31st, <laughs> um, we would be arriving at Fair Oaks to do the, uh, the swine tour so students get a chance to see a 9,000 sow swine operation. And they also get a chance to see the agronomy side of things and uh, go in and see how yogurt, cheese, and ice cream are manufactured through their glass windows. Uh, we also would be traveling to uh, Ozark Fish Farms, which is on the southwest side of Indianapolis, along with down in Branson, Missouri. And we'll get a chance to see how they uh, spawn fish and create all kinds of new varieties of fish uh, for our pet stores. Uh, and that's acres. And, I've shown the students in aquaculture class the acres and acres of ponds that they have uh, to create that fish uh, species for all of us to enjoy in the pet stores. Um, along with opening session at Lucas Oil Stadium, uh, dinner theater performance Wednesday night, Thursday, uh, spending all day at the convention center to, honestly, I think it's one of the best career shows in this country. Uh, the map, I have the map here in their itinerary uh, to see every major agricultural industry uh, representative there along with every tech school and university throughout the country is, is absolutely amazing. Uh, there's the FFA Mall, there's student workshops, there's the Agri-Science Fair, the chance to see the Hall of States, to see what are the top commodities from each state and have representatives, student representatives there to see that. Honestly, my favorite is Puerto Rico to try and taste all the different coffees that they import uh, to the convention center, uh, along with going to different award ceremony sessions within Lucas Oil. Uh, later that afternoon, we're going to Hunter's Honey Farm and they get a chance to see how honey is produced on a large scale uh, and distributed to uh, big box stores throughout our country. Uh, and then again, Friday, being at the convention center to do that all again. And uh, there's some entertainment to see the rodeo that evening. Rodeo and, and concert entertainment tickets sold out in eight minutes. 
this past year. Yeah, there's over 80,000 people expected to be in Indianapolis that week from all across the country and Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Virgin Islands. So it's, it's a neat experience for the students to get a chance to see uh, agriculture on a, on, a, on a scope from our entire country. And if anyone ever wants to attend with us, I'd greatly love to take you along and, and show you the neat things that are happening at National Athletic Convention. Yeah. So seeking approval to travel with students outside the state of Wisconsin to Indianapolis, Indiana. I will move to approve that. I'll second. Motion by Sarah, second by Chad. Any other discussion? Thank you. Thank you for kids. Thank you for Well, are we like are we limited? Like what limits us only doing seven? Is it just due to like if we sent more in the past or less, or you know, would there be an opportunity in the future to to do more or absolutely there's op there's opportunities and what I've kind of laid out to the students, there's ways to earn your trip completely to get there. Uh, we've taken students in the past for the nursery and landscape CD contest. Uh, we've taken students that have uh, per performed really well on their SAE projects and the student work-based learning. Uh, so depending on how they do that, uh, they get their American degree, uh, they compete in a leadership development speaking contest, a career development event, agri-science fair, or you know, run to be a state officer. We, we can help them get to that uh, conference. And I've already been, a, uh, at, my, at my former employer, I was actually at the convention center 20 minutes because we had students flying in to do their proficiencies to get their American degrees uh, we had three teams down there for proficiency, uh, for career development events. We had one down there for a leadership development event. Like it's doable. We we can take more students uh, in some of those accolades, and that's what we're trying to build now. Again, after COVID, like it's trying to get that momentum going. And it seems like this year, between what we've done at the middle school and high school, that momentum is going. So I, I expect great things out of this year that we'll have a lot more to attend in the future. That maybe some might go to bus and some will be in a van or might have to do airfare to get there depending if they're off to college and need to come in. Yeah, I only bring that up because I mean if there's a way for us to be proactive and offer it to, you know, I don't know what the ideal number is or what, you know, if it's seven, if it's twenty, if it's, you know, whatever it might be. I think there's I'm guessing that there's probably a lot of support from the board and mm -hmm. you know we are an agricultural community and it's yeah. sounds like an awesome opportunity for kids to be a part of. And I think if if there is the you know future scope to do more, mm -hmm. we're probably open to consider how we can make that possible. So, mm -hmm. okay. Thank uh, you. All in favor? Uh, so, so approval. Uh, seek, the motion was to approve of the uh, students being able to go travel outside the state um, for the convention as presented. Uh, motion by Sarah, second by Chad. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Motion carried. Have a great time. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for getting there. Thank you. Thanks, 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 All right. Now we're back to, I think, uh, final approval of the 23 24 budget and tax levy. Hi, Jim. Hi, Jim. All right, so when I was here for the annual meeting in September, we talked about the tax levy option. So I'm bringing that back to you. Um, on Friday, the state aid number came in, so that's final. And we know that's final. There also, we got the final equalization aid numbers for all the property values that came in sometime late September. So there's been a lot of pieces of the puzzle coming in all the way through Friday. <laughs> the tax levy actually has to be set by October 31st by law. So just so you know, so here we are, we got the information, I'm here tonight to make the decision tonight and then report that to the state. Um, going into our options, our, actually our state aid came in less than I had expected. I had expected our state aid was going to be 13.6 million dollars and that was a number that they had given in July. I paired that back to like 13.5 million, it's not on the screen, but um, it actually came in at 13.443 million dollars. Uh, now the state has implemented a new computer system um, within this last year. So it's 
basically there's an amount of state aid and then every school gets their piece of state aid, right? And it's dependent on the numbers that the schools put into this computer system while the computer system's not really working. Uh, it's it's working, it's just that this information is getting in there late. So mm -hmm. before we used to pinpoint it within probably like $10,000 and I knew the number well before I was gonna come here and now it's not quite that way anymore. And it's it's not that it was significantly different, but it is different. So I'll mute that. So again, with our proposed tax levy, now I put all this new information in there. Uh, the gray column is what happened in 22-23. So our total school levy was $12.5 million with a mill rate of 975. So today we're setting the tax levy. So we're setting this $12.5 million is what you said last year, and that's what you'll be uh, voting on here tonight. So there are four options. Option one is to keep the same mill rate at 975. Uh, in order to do that, we would do what's called a debt defeasance, or basically setting money aside to pay down our debt early. And that would uh, bring the school tax levy up to 14.844 million with the mill rate of 975. Option two, same tax levy at 12.5 million dollars. That would defease debt of the $800,000 that we would be able to pay off early at the mill rate of 822. Um, the option three in the middle, uh, that would be a debt defeasance of $500,000 with a school levy of $12.2 million for a mill rate of eight oh three, And finally, no defeasance. We, we just are asking for the operational budget um, that is decided per pupil, and that would be $11.7 million of a tax levy or $7.70. Kim, can you remind us the benefits of defeasing again? Um, you'll see on the next slide. So every time you have, all of this is considered spending. So the more you spend, the more state aid you get. So that would actually in future years reduce um, the amount of property tax that the taxpayers have to pay. So the more you spend, the more state aid you get. The less you spend, the less state aid. And it's proportionate. And we'll kind of see that, um, I'll show you, you on one of the upcoming slides here, I'll point it out. So this slide here again in gray is uh, what happened already last year. So calendar year 2022 or the 22-23 year, property equalized values or also known as fair market values went up 15.15% in that time. And at that time of the 15.15%, net new construction was about 1%. So. Um, the values are determined by the Wisconsin Department of Revenue, and they're saying, you know, the values in your municipality have gone up based on the data that they use. In the yellow, I've um, boxed out the column here, property values went up again, 18.47% district-wide. And if you look at the numbers, Abrams went up 17.42%, Brazo went up 13 So on in total, on average, they went up 18.47, but there's some that went up a lot more. Like, look at the town of Pensaki at 28.3%. Uh, Spruce went up 23%. So when we talk about, and I go through this, individual municipalities, some will get more a portion of the tax, and some will get less because now um, on, they're below or above the average. Okay. And that new construction of that 18.47% is 1.5. So again, not a big factor. Here's where we'll see um, where if we spend more money, we get more money in the next year. <coughs> if we were to levy at the same mill rate at $14.84 um, million dollars at 975. The next year we would expect to have uh, the tax levy be $12.2 million, okay? Um, as we go through the thing, that will come down. It, uh, it will go up, I said that the wrong way. We'll have to levy more in order because we'll have spent less money. Right. Okay. And I want you to focus on within the box in red, if we levy 14.8 million and the next year 12.2, 
and then 12.6 we're going to levy so it's going to the taxpayers are going to see a high levy then low and then ramp back up in the tax levy match uh here we have 12.5 million uh then it shows 12.2 million again in and then 12.6 million so in this instance we could defuse debt in that uh, second year again and keep it at 12.5 all the way across so it's the, the most stable of the options um, here we would have an option in the middle at the five hundred thousand dollar defeasance 12.2 um, then 12.2 again so now we're stable for two years but our future is looking that we're going to have to levy more in the future. Now, a lot of things are going to change in between now and then, and that's based on bringing those property values back down to earth at 2%, because at some point, I would imagine that that's not going to continue to grow, but I don't know that either. And then no debt defeasance. I'll bring that to 11.7, but then we go down and then we'd have to ramp it back up. So the taxpayers, we're kind of, we're not just looking at this year, we're looking at our strategy over the course of time. And when we defease debt, it's very good because we're not, we're able to bring that loan payment down and that's gonna help us in the future and keep the property taxes low, you know, over time. So if we keep it steady instead of going up and down and up and down. Okay, so one other piece of information that I didn't bring to you last time and I've learned a lot more about this week is um, there's also what's called the school tax levy credit. You'll notice it on your property tax bill. It's in the uh, lower left corner on that bill. Um, normally, the school districts don't talk about this because we're setting that levy before this credit happens and that's something on your own personal bill. Um, but with the biennial budget, there was a 27% increase to that school tax levy credit, which was the largest increase in the history of that credit, and it started in 1996. So now this increase is so significant, you'll notice an impact on your personal property tax bill. So this information is courtesy of WASBO. This is O'Connor Falls share based on um, they added $255 million to the school tax levy credit, and then based on our property values, uh, WASBO calculated this. So last year, our district received $1.9 million, and this coming year, 23-24, is expected to receive $2.5 million for an increase of $625,000. Now, uh, the number in yellow is just the number that I used in the calculation. So instead of using that full amount, because I don't know exactly how that's gonna look, we're just using a conservative estimate of 75% of that number. So keep this in mind. <clears throat> so bringing back um, all those four options, if you look in 22-23, um, the district asked for a levy of $12.5 million but if you take off the school tax levy credit, the net levy was 10 million six. Um, if we look at our option two with that same tax levy um, for the upcoming year, where if we would ask for $12.5 million to take off the school levy credit, we're actually asking taxpayers for 9.9 .9 million, so less than in the prior year net, net levy. Now again, you're setting that uh, school <laughs> levy not in the orange, that information comes on there individual bill. Something I want to pitch out there that's a drastic change from the past is a lot of what Kim is talking to you, the board, about is the levy amount. And in the past, we've talked a lot about the mill rate. And the mill rate has worked for us back when we were not seeing 15 and 18 percent average increases in valuation. The last two years, the mill rate is not a good focus anymore. So she's investing a lot of time tonight in last meeting, walking you through the actual levy amount. And you can see the mill rate is going to fluctuate significantly. I mean, you're looking at potentially going down a buck and a half or more. Um, but that makes sense if you think about the valuation of your property has changed 15% last year and 18% this year. So by focusing on that levy amount, you're really being thoughtful about what is each municipality going to have to bring forward. And as 
Kim just brought to your attention, you know, realistically, there's a slide that she's about to bring up that gives you information about each municipality. She's not talking about individual taxpayers, but about a municipality. Yeah, so tonight, everything that I'm showing you is all the information I have. So outside of this, then we're just speculating what would happen on somebody's bill. So th this is the information that is known. So then I took that information in and did this uh, calculation. So maybe we could break it down and see where maybe a taxpayer would end up. So again, in gray, this was the equalized value in 22-23 and how much each of those municipalities had of the 12.5 million or the tax apportionment that they had to pay. If we do that um, exercise again, here we have the 18.47% and we allocate that then the apportionment between all of our dif different options, option one, two, three, and four. So you see, um, Abrams is the first one here. So last year, um, their portion value was 2424000 So that's how much their municipality had to pay. If we go with the same $12.5 million uh, levy this year, they would actually have a portion $2,402,000. So it's slightly less. And again, that has to do with their change over the prior year was 17.42%, which is less than the average. Okay. So again, there's going to be winners and there's going to be losers in this exercise because not all municipalities change the same. It would just be way easier if they were all exactly the same because then we wouldn't have these variations year over year. So taking this then one step further, um, in the option two, again, I'm just focusing in on the 12.5 because it's the easiest comparable. Anything that's in a bracket that's a negative number and anything that's a positive um, is a positive number. So here, for example, Abrams would actually their portion share of the tax would go down 22,000. But if we look at Hinsaki's would go up $55,000. Fencing there, right? 14,008. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Spruces would go up 55.5. Um, then in the peach columns that say estimated there, um, that's taking into account now the change in the mill rate and the levy per $100,000 home, um, and then also subtracting out that increase in the school tax levy credit. So I've included that in there because that's a very important piece. It equates to about 33 cents per $1,000. So it's pretty significant. Um, if you see, uh, Abrams would actually, per in a hundred thousand dollar home, would based on this calculation would pay forty dollars less. Um, the town of Pensacki would pay maybe uh, twenty nine dollars more. Now I used the more conservative school tax levy credit, and here it could actually be more because I didn't want to put it too high either in case something uh, changed along the way. It shouldn't really change, but now you have to remember outside of this, people are getting reassessed in their municipality. So that's all. There's a lot of other variables that are outside of the information that we know. But if everything stayed exactly the same, right. this is what people would see on their bills. So um, when you're making a decision, you're making the decision for all 10 municipalities at one time. You can't say this one is this and this one's that. You have to do it as an, a big group. So again, we have our three options. Option one being where most people would likely see an increase to their property taxes. And you can see how much here by municipality um, that where we ask exactly the same amount, most would actually see a push to a reduction. Um, and then as you go down, most would see a reduction. So as we go further down uh, the line with our option three and four, you're seeing more where the taxpayer would see a reduction. They're going to bring their tax bill down. But then again, we're looking to the future and what if we have to bring it back up? Um, so in my opinion, option two, you know, we're, we're asking for the same amount of money and it's a push for most, but again, the discussion that we'd be asking for the same, but cumulatively with the tax credit piece, it effectively 
from a cumulative sense, again, as individual <laughs> taxpayer is going to see something a little bit different. Right. But as a district, we would be asking for actually less than what we no, are. Yeah. 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 No, yeah. Net, net, we would be asking would be for less, less uh, but our school <clears throat> levy that if you voted on it would be the same, almost the same as the prior year. So again, here are the options. Right. So option two would be the levy would be the same. The yeah, same. the net, yeah. but the net, the net levy would be that. Would be which the net levy is actually what the taxpayer actually mm -hmm. right. But that, but there's, there's, you see the school line, and then you see another line that's the, the, the credit, correct? Yes. Well, it, the, the school line actually has the credit taken out of it. It's shown oh, it in does. the box, okay. but then it is subtracted from. There. Okay, got it. Okay. So I'm going to stop at this point because I also have to talk about budget. Um, this is where I would need the tax levy approval. So I need the board to vote on which option you would like to set. Well, I think Kim has done her research and she has given us um, her recommendation of, of option two. I don't see a significant amount of difference between option two and option three, except for volatility in year two, where we would go down and go up. So if we can stay steady, uh, reduce the impact on the taxpayers overall, I would make a motion that we would go with option two and move to the same school levy, the 12-5. I'll second that. Okay. Motion by Carrie. Second by Sarah. Specific to the levy to um, select option two. Open it up for discussion. Um, in that motion, can we put the dollar amount too? Yep. Yeah. So the motion is, uh, is option two at a tax a school levy of twelve thousand or twelve million five hundred and nineteen thousand thirty six dollars. Other discussion? Okay. All in favor? All right. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Aye. <laughs> Motion carried. Okay. Okay, so budget. Um you see today Another one in the DPI format budget. This is just showing the change from what I brought to you at the annual meeting in September, which is the first column, uh, versus where we're going to end here October 16th. <clears throat> now, a budget, as soon as you set a budget, it's already obsolete. So I, it just even from September to October, I've gotten just so much more information, and we're just going to continually change. But we're going to work within these parameters then from now for the rest of the year. If any budget major budget changes, I'll bring those back to you, and that's usually in spring. Um, just to explain the significant changes um, that have occurred, I have a slide here. So if you notice the 200 line on the DPI format, um, we increased the tax levy $275,000. $159,000 relates to the final state aid was less than I originally budgeted, which I explained to you. Uh, we received $68,000 increased revenue limit because of transfer of service. So we have students coming from other districts to get to levy more, and that was just uh, determined this past week. Uh, 47, just about 48,000. We had an increase in our private school voucher estimate. Um, I don't get that information until late in the year. And it's not our <coughs> private school vouchers. We have students that reside here but attend at all the private schools. It's not just St. Anthony's, they are attending many other schools out there. Um, in the 300 line, we had 52,000. Dollar increase because our open enrollment students in were more than um, we had estimated now that the uh, third Friday pupil count was complete. 
And then finally, the same reduction, 159,000 in brackets there, um, because our state aid came in less than we had said. So in the expenditures area in Fund 10, um, if you notice, there are functions. So what, what we're spending it on, so the 100,000 function is instruction. instruction. I reduced that expenditure by $231,000 because we have two middle school teachers, uh, one Abrams math interventionist, and one English language learner teacher, that those positions went unfilled. So now it's not in that instruction line. I moved it from there and into the $400,000, 400,000, <laughs> 400,000 line, which is called non-program transactions, but that's just where substitutes are put. Okay, um, so it's just an accounting transfer. Uh, next, the 200,000 session, uh, we increased our expenditures by 180,000. Uh, we um, reported some professional development and some technology purchases that were needed and reallocated that. Uh, $217,000 increase in the substitute budget and $146,000 increase in expenditures because our open enrollment out was actually bigger. Um, we had more students open enroll out than we had projected and that came in again with our third party pupil count. And finally, the, there's a cross between Fund 10 and Fund 27. Um, fund 10 will have, is expected to have 117,000 less of a transfer to fund 27. We had three um, paraprofessionals that added in within this last month or right before school started and they took the MOI instead of the health insurance plan. The MOI is a $5,000 in lieu of health insurance and it, it's a big savings to the district that we offer that. So those are the significant changes that I told you from September to October. Now, if you adapt and set this uh, budget, we will work within these parameters. Okay? okay. Uh, and I just want to reiterate again, Fund 80, we talked about last time, does include to complete that walking trail over by the high school. So when you're voting, then we're going to take action and move forward on that. Uh, any questions on the budget? I think so. So I would like to have made a motion to approve the budget as stated. I will move to approve the budget as stated. I'll second that. Question uh, by Sarah, second by Emily to approve the budget as presented. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you again, Kim. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, Kim. Yeah. The work is appreciated. Great work. Mm -hmm. yes. All right. Next up, uh, SRO agreement. <clears throat> so last month we brought to you the board the fact that we had a team of administrators working together with uh, Chief Olson and Jeff Coon to review the past collaboration that we've had with the City of Oconto Falls for our school resource officer. Um, in that conversation, you shared that you wanted to take a look at that. So we provided you with a hard copy that if you take a look, you can see there's, um, there's red where we had things that we wanted to have conversation on back when we were, it was between admin and, and the city. Um, one of the things that you'll notice is that we, the whole school resource officer which versus police school liaison officer, it's just a term, it's the same thing. We took it out of the first view, but then I see that there's still some PSLOs that we gotta clean up in the last couple pages. Um, but in a nutshell, some of the changes that we had talked about during our process um, ensuring that there was a collaboration between the SRO and our assistant principals at the secondary level to develop a rubric um, relative to expectations and the evaluation process. Um, other than that, it was things such as ensuring that we've identified what are the major objectives of the position. Um, we identified some pieces in there relative to um, 
we want the SRO working at all of our buildings. In the past, it was um, a lot at the secondary level and not as much at the elementary, specifically not as much at the rooms. And we're trying to make sure that Detective Coon gets an opportunity to work in all of the buildings. Um, I don't know if there's anything specific in here that caught anybody's attention that you want to talk about. Um, but in a nutshell, we appreciate this collaboration with the city. One thing that you also probably noticed is that the dollar amounts were not written in there. They're still in negotiation between the city and um, law enforcement. And so when those numbers are developed, then we'll share them with Kim and, and we'll add them into this document. We don't anticipate it will be anything significantly different than the process we just went through this last spring with our own employees. So one thing that I did want to bring up, um, and I may have mentioned this before. Um, so part of the mission of this position is to also um, encourage students to and increase comfort levels with police and law enforcement officials. Correct. So we want them to be comfortable going to not only our SRO, but other police officers in the community. They can feel safe going to them. Correct. That's kind of the philosophy behind it. Well, yes. I won't say that this position, I don't think there's nothing written in, written in here saying that they're going to have an effect on the county. Okay. Sure. I think the county does a pretty nice job of being involved in different activities. Like if you come to our football game on Friday night, you'll see um, often county folks there from law enforcement as well as somebody from the ambulance. You know, So those people I think are doing their own, but this position, I think law enforcement in general, but specifically her as our school uh, Right. Resources. I guess I should be more specific. So um, the other SROs that I see in the closed schools, they are uniform. Okay. And I would I would like to see our SRO in a uniform. I don't know if that's a possibility or not in this draft, but I would like to have. Can you expand on that a little bit, Carrie? Yeah, so we not only want our juveniles to be comfortable going to Jamie, but we also want them comfortable going to other police officers in the community to go to them with, with issues, okay? So oftentimes if we're getting into the elementary schools, they see the uniform, so they are more comfortable to go to another uniform to talk to them about things that they may need or report things. Um, we want to, there's many things that we can accomplish by just putting that individual in, in a uniform, I think. that. Opinion may be different. Is there like a specific policy or anything on like the dress code for this position as it states right now? Not, Not really. Okay. Well, I'll I'll throw it there. I mean, we're you may or may not agree, but I feel like we're products of our own experience. So um, I've only had experience in one other district with an SRO, and it was they wore their, <clears throat> at times they wore their their full uniform. Um, at times they had modified uniforms and to some extent that depended on the individual. So like if you had an SRO that came right off from um, working a um, squad, let's say, versus if you had somebody from the detective department, their uniforms were, their daily uniform was not the same. So um, I've seen both and I understand the thought process behind it. Um, <laughs> you can determine if you want to ask my opinion. It's an interesting thought. I mean, it's. I feel like there's definitely some validity there to that, to that thought process. You're gonna. What is your opinion? I can see validity to what Carrie's bringing up. I guess I would pitch out there. Um, I'm not sure I would be in favor of it being a requirement every day uh, because there's the other side to it. Um, part of making that connection is kids being willing to see us for 
the person and the position. And so sometimes it may be hard for kids to get past the, the uniform. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's, I see both sides to it. Mm -hmm. I see a level of flexibility there that could be beneficial. Um, I guess I'm gonna reach out to somebody who's in the trenches every day, um, who is in a secondary building and has the law enforcement present. Do you have a thought? Let me restate that. Do you have a thought you'd be willing to share? We actually have two principles on there. Yeah, yeah I was going to say. <laughs> I, I, I think the product of our own environment is there's a lot of truth to that. Um, mm -hmm. In my previous district, um, he was not uniformed, um, but he was always wore, he was in his uniform when he did, um, like when he taught in the classroom, he wore his uniform. Um, or if he did a parent presentation, or so there's like specific, mm -hmm. a, a specific like occasion, not just a day to day thing, he wore his uniform. Um, and then on days that he wasn't, he wasn't in street clothes, but he was in like, um, the polo and tactical <laughs> mm -hmm. pants and maybe like a polo or yeah. police polo or something like that. Mm -hmm. So that was my previous experience. I'll say that. Um, I can see it both ways, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. very easily. I think uh, in, because we're secondary people, I think the reference that you're making, a lot of times I was an elementary school teacher. Mm -hmm. And so I think of that in an elementary, mm -hmm. which is part of the job too. So, I mean, there, that's neither, it's it's not, sure. you know, one of them all the way the other. I, what do you think? I, I totally understand where you're coming from. Um, but I, I will also say that I think, I don't know what Jamie's regular uniform is because of her role as a detective. So I, I can understand the idea, but I don't, I don't know if Jamie, even as a detective, even has a an issue. Like I'm not sure. I, 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 even when I've seen her in the summertime, when she's coming in from work, I'm not sure. What yeah. Her, what her what the protocol is or what the expectation is of her as a detective. Mm -hmm. I know in, in other places I've been at, detectives do have a little bit different different uh, different dress code maybe or different dress mm -hmm. expectation than somebody who is working a patrol. Yep. So, Stuart, did you have um, SROs at uh, either Winter Burnwood or uh, yeah. Shawano? And they were they were in they were in uniform, but again they were patrol police officers uh, who were working as um, as the SRO. They were not uh, detective. So, and, and I in that in that regard, um, Officer Ross. Stuart's brother is our uh, project alert. He does. He teaches in the classroom, and he's always uniformed because he's yeah. he comes off the road. Mm -hmm. so. Is she? <clears throat> I'm just looking at this. I'm just trying to look through this, to answer my own question, but it's probably just easier to ask it. Is <clears throat> in her contract? Is it? Does it state that she's an SRO or a detective? Well, she's a school resource officer. Basically, she's a detective that's detailed to us as an SRO. Mm -hmm. So the city pays half of her resource and we pay half of the resource. Um, but her her job duties here are SRO mm -hmm. correct. within the school. Yep, within the four schools that make up mm -hmm. the district. I guess my, my initial thought is that I would talk to Jamie to see like what what her what her normal normal attire is when she's working too. Because yeah. there's a bit the, the, the fact that she is a detective that's assigned here. Well, I think we already know the answer to that. I'm, I mean, I've been here now this is my ninth year, and a gigantic majority of the time she's in that more tactical situation where she's wearing like tactical pants and boots and. Mm -hmm has her badge usually around her neck or stuck on a belt. Um, she's usually armed and sometimes she's wearing a vest and sometimes you know that vest is outside or inside of a shirt of some kind. I, I suppose that's important if you're not used to seeing her at school you probably can't envision what she's wearing. 
she wears her badge around her neck. So it's always right here. Right? It's very, it would be immediately hard. visible that it would be hard to not there's no question that, see she's, that she's a police officer and she's you can see her her weapon on her hip here clearly as well. So, okay. the only other thing that I can think about too is um, <clears throat> a mark squad. I don't know if we can ever have that in front of the schools. Um, and I don't know if that's possible, but I know that it is a deterrent sometimes um, to have a visible police car out in front. I don't know what Jamie drives at this point, and I don't know what the option is, but to have a visible presence that we have a police officer yeah. on the premise would maybe serve a good purpose. Well, I guess to move the dis move the discussion along, the, the contract, as it were, I guess we have any major questions just specifically about the wording in the contract, the requirements of the role, expectations, anything on that? I like the collaboration. I I like those the verbiage in there, working along with. Um, mm -hmm. That's those are very good terms that I like to see in this contract. I did have a, a question where private office was changed to access to a private area. Is that just because, so well, I guess. Is, this came up this year. Uh, <coughs> and in a perfect world, we'd be able to offer the SRO private office in, in every building. Right. We are really tight on space in some of the buildings. And so we recognize that um, there are times where our SRO needs to have a private area to conduct either business for us, or there's also a level of flexibility where she might be doing some of her work for the city, but she decides it makes more sense to do it right here in, in our building, um, rather than lose the travel time and whatever. So we recognize the private area. It may not be a space that's absolutely dedicated, that it's her office all year by herself. That may not be the case. It may be a situation where she's sharing with someone and then if she needs something, hey, Stuart, I need to use the, the conference room for the next three hours. And he's like, yep, absolutely. Or same thing, Steph, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's one of those things where it, it, was a, it was a topic of discussion. Hey, do I have my own office? And well, maybe, maybe not. So... Does she have a private office at any of the buildings? She does at the high school right now. Okay. Yep. Well, we've had, I know right now from a design standpoint, I think it's designed into the new middle school, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so we recognize it, we value it, we just are within the boundaries of what we have right now. Mm -hmm. um, I realize private area, because be kind of subjective so it's just an understanding between her and the administrative team at that particular building exactly what what she needs in that moment well a private area is pretty detailed because of her role so okay. it means private and it, it has to be great because she very well okay. may be investigating something that's highly confidential so, that's where i was going but it may not be the same spot every day for her because when you look at her role, she's not going to be there every day, all day in that role. She's in four different buildings. Mm -hmm. She's part-time for us and part-time for the city. So we're trying to figure out to ensure that she does have an office at some point, if at all possible, but we'll get her what she needs to do her job. Perfect. That answers my question. Really. Because she does work here her hours are she works here yeah she's stationed here the full work week but she's also works for the city so she does that work oftentimes on our campus which is why the uniform thing kind of can be mm -hmm. she doesn't wear a uniform when she's working for the city because she does she does detective work so mm -hmm. you know she's doing that work while she's working with us or us as yeah. well. So. Well, that changes. So an example will be, she'll send an email out that said, hey, something just came down and I'm going to be investigating 
um, a, sp a very specific situation for the next three days. And so I'm going to be unavailable. And if you need something, you'll have to reach out to um, this number for whoever is on duty at that time to come and assist you. Well, she doesn't get to set that schedule. That's something, you know, somebody's making poor choices and she needs to go and assist with that. So there's a level of flexibility with her job that's required. And we understand that. Um, we have situations that sometimes will take up a significant amount of time and the city flexes to allow her to be with us for two days straight. Um, and then in the summer, she's with us a lot less and with the city more so that she can deal with us more in the other nine months. So, and, and we've appreciated that level of flexibility. I think they have as well. Yeah, I, I think we could be in a situation where we had someone else that was maybe in uniform all the time and we'd, we'd want them to maybe dress it down a little bit and be, be approachable. So I. I understand. I can't agree. I, I, <laughs> I can't agree. I, no. no. <laughs> I understand your I understand your your comments. I, I think it's up to the board to decide we move forward and, and what sort of motion do you guys want to put on the table. Certainly the, the agreement <clears throat> is the is the critical part. Jamie will do could do a great job of making that uniform more approachable. So wearing the uniform and being Jamie, who Jamie is, and doing a great job for us. She could do a lot for that uniform. I honestly don't know which way I would vote right now if we did. So, I mean, if we can take some time to think about it, I mean, if that's where we're going with a vote, I mean, I don't know which way it would fall right in this moment. <laughs> Do you want me to bring this back to the board and ask Jamie to come yeah. present to you? Yeah. 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 Is everybody comfortable with that sort of con concept? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. So then we do want to move you do want to move forward though with uh, with the agreement, and then that would simply in the November meeting, we'll bring that back up discuss it and that would simply be an addendum if we need to make a mod or would we just hold off on approving the agreement well, this is still a draft. it's a draft but i guess i'm looking at it like and this is up to you whether or not you're going to allow dress code to potentially derail your collaboration with the city of Wakanda falls no and so in my mind if you're not going to do that then you could approve us moving forward with this, I mean, it's it's always up for, I mean, if you want to adjust something, it's just a phone call. And again, they've been pretty flexible with that. <clears throat> so you could approve this right now, and then I'll talk to Jamie and say, the board would like to have a conversation with you regarding dress code for the position of SRO. And then she can have a conversation with you know, Chief Olson, and she can come and talk to you you do whatever you decide then relative to dress code recognizing that you're half of the equation okay so you can be as strong as you want to be in that but then ultimately they get to come back and say what they want to say and you know maybe we lock our head and maybe we don't i don't know what that looks like okay but so far our we've been able to in the changes that we asked for in this one it was very very flexible and reasonable conversation so so I'm willing to move forward and make a motion to approve the um, agreement between the City of Wakanda Falls Police Department and Wakanda Falls Police Department for the SRO position. Okay. Motion by Carrie. Second. Second by Chad. Any other discussion? I think we already discussed a good a bit. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, so I will then follow up with Jamie to ask her to plan to be at the next board meeting to present to you all in regards to um, the current dress and the you know, flexibility issue. Then. Mm -hmm. okay. Can you come up a slide if we can? Yep, I can work that in there too. Okay. okay. All right, Appendix B we already covered, and we're on a sports staff salary schedule. Okay. So 
two different things that we're bringing to the board. Um, I guess I'll go with the easy one first. The transportation PD rate. So when we want to do professional development with folks in the transportation department, we'd like to set that at 1720 an hour. And then the other piece to this is, and I'll just I'll put this right out there, this is an oversight on my part. So let me give you some history on this. Um, about four or five years ago, I started bringing to you changes to the board relative to our administrative team. So at the time we had building up principles that had um, contracts ranging from like 215 to 220 days per year. And that aligned with their secretaries and it wasn't very realistic in all honesty. Um, they were working more days than that in order to accomplish the jobs that they were doing, um, both they and their secretaries. So you all took actions to bring them up to 260 day contracts um, three out of the four, you did the fourth one here just a, a month or two ago. And so what happened after that was then we started seeing a disparity in that their secretaries were not having the same number of days as the person that they primarily worked for as their direct supervisor. And so we also recognized that um, to try to remain competitive, we wanted to take a look at the market and so one of the things that we did is I had a conversation um, with the legal counsel for the school district and we looked at uh, the need for the level of flexibility as well for identifying their level of authority. And so there was a difference between the person that was the number one or the number two secretary in the offices. And we moved to starting to act as they were a salaried person. They were going to be working 260 days and in doing so, they had a greater level of flexibility to work with their principals, who at times are not simply a, um, I'll say it's a seven to four type position. So if something is starting a little bit earlier, being a little bit later, we took that into account. I met at the time with the secretaries. I asked them, um, are you truly putting in all of your hours on your timesheets? And the answers at the time was no, they didn't, they, they were not. And I said, well, that's not reasonable. And they said, well, we're really uncomfortable with that. And I said, well, please sit down and, and pull together what is a realistic number of hours that you're putting in. And they did that. And then we developed um, what we thought was a salary that honored those hours. And three out of the four people said that that would be, they felt the benefit to them. So three of the four secretaries were moved into an administrative assistant position. Um, and the fourth one has not up to this point. So it was brought to our attention here recently that um, people knew this was happening, but this wasn't part of the salary schedule. And I was surprised to find out they were correct and I'll take responsibility for that. Um, so we're bringing this to the board to basically bring to you what we have been doing as a school district, what we feel is in the best interest of the people that are in these positions. So a little bit more on this. So an administrative assistant um, by the information that was shared from legal counsel, the differentiation between that as a sec and a secretary is they have a greater level of authority to make decisions than a secretary would. And so I will tell you having been a building principal, um, for quite a while, um, you have so many irons in the fire at a building level that you need somebody that acts in your stead when you're not there. So an example might be early mornings. Um, we never, we often don't have all the resource we need to run. And so we have to make decisions about who's going to cover what classes. Um, when I'm rolling into the building and there's already an issue going on on the other end of the wing, um, that person might be making some decisions relative to where are we going to send the subs, where are we not going to send the subs, interacting with some of my um, our staff to identify who has preps throughout the day to try to line them up to cover a class that's gone uncovered. Um, so there's a, a that's just in one example. Um, I gave the example tonight where you know Donna was working on 
coordinating with the other members of the high school and activity that's happening on a Saturday um, and then rolls in to make that work. So there's a higher expectation, there's a higher level of responsibility and that's why we've broken this out away from the secretary pool. Um, it's just trying to be thoughtful. It's one of our key interests to recruit and retain and it's trying to align that level of responsibility with the compensation. So, so we we've offered it to four, but only three took it. At this point, three have taken it. Yes, okay. and we've gotten by with that other person. Um, now I shared that that fourth person recently was moved here within the last few months to a two sixty, okay. and so I fully anticipate that there will probably be a conversation there. Now, what the outcome will be, I I don't know. Okay. But the intent is not to shove somebody into something that they don't want to be in. Um, but we're trying to provide the support that we think is in the best interest of students, ultimately through the staff. So that was the only feedback that we got from legal was that it was about making decisions on behalf of their supervisor in their absence. That's the big difference. Um, okay. In order to move somebody into this type of a role, you have to ask yourself the question, do they have the ability to make decisions of significance in your absence? Um, and I'm not gonna speak for those two people out there, but when I was in their role, at times they do. Um, <coughs> that's Donna for Stuart and it's Rose for Stephanie. And those, if you've ever worked in a building, um, it's kind of a, People put it out there in a comedic way, but they say they run the building. They say they say <laughs> if, the, if the principal's gone, we can we can survive. But if the principal's administrative assistant is gone, it's very difficult. Um, I mean, and, that's that is the joke. Like, you know. The administrative assistant has their hands in many different facets of the day-to-day -day operations um, beyond what somebody in, let's say, um, an assistant secretary role would be in. Usually the assistant secretary, the number two, has a more specialized, they might be working with absences and working with specific areas of need, whereas that administrative assistant is covering every aspect of the operation. Mm -hmm. So, in a perfect world, this would have been brought to you multiple years ago already. So, this is me trying to clean something up. So basically approving what's already in place. Yeah, one of the things that we did is we <clears throat> you have a range there from low to high. So low is a little bit lower than our people are currently at because we have some people in those roles who are extremely experienced and doing an outstanding job. And we went a little bit higher than they currently are. So there's room for growth. So which is what we've done with. And again, the, the, the Appendix B and in this case, the salary schedules, we continue to update these. So you're seeing it at least quarterly where we're bringing you changes because we're trying to make sure that we're, we're competitive in the market. Kim and I were just having a topic today about some other pieces that we need to bring to you in the next month or two because it's changing so quickly. Okay. <clears throat> if you guys look down way on the bottom, what we're looking at. It seems that we're only paying a coach $25 flat rate. I guess I have a problem with that because if they're driving three hours, they're only going to get $25. If we did have a driver, we would have to try finding a bus driver that would take us. So they have a no. This is the van. This is a van. This is just van. If coach drives van for their team, and you actually just—that's kind of your the point you're bringing up. The big difference there is the CDL. Mm -hmm. One requires a CDL and one does not. So right now we have coaches that have their CDL and they're driving a bus and they're not being paid that twenty-five dollar flat rate. They're getting their hourly plus, okay, plus mileage. Yeah. Yeah. So this is like golf. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we're voting that the group of kids and the smaller team. Sometimes track takes the the van. Right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's not to say that that won't be something that comes up in the future because, again, we're constantly reevaluating. Re but the piece that you're bringing up, the big difference is the city. Is the transportation, I guess, the one that we were looking at, 1720? Is that? Is that where it should be? For right now, we think so, yeah. Okay. It's in alignment with what we're doing with some of our other employee groups. Some are a little bit lower and some are a little bit higher. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? So we're looking for a motion to approve the support staff salary schedule with these couple of highlighted changes. Correct. I'll make a motion to approve the proposed changes to the support staff salary schedule. Motion by Emily. Or, uh, yep, motion by Emily. Second. Second by Brian. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion <coughs> Early graduation requests. <coughs> All right. So, um, we're bringing to the board tonight, we had nine seniors uh, who have uh, made a request for early graduation uh, this school year. Um, so just to kind of give everybody an update on what that what that looks like. There is an early graduation uh, application that they have to fill out uh, signed by their parents. Uh, and then there's a conference with uh, the school counselor and review them and then it goes to me for approval as well. So um, part of that process is we, we like to see the students have a uh, plan. And so as part of my uh, information to you, you can see that there is um, students in question do have a uh, plan, uh, a number of them, it's either starting uh, college early, some are looking at military, um, some have um, a real specific plan, you know, as far as like, their, their track. So um, I guess at this point, just so you understand as well, this all this stuff is dependent, these nine is dependent upon their um, their successful completion of the credit load that they need in order to graduate. So if for some reason um, they don't, they're not successful in one of their credits that they're trying to obtain in order to get the 26 to graduate, they would come back and they may understand that as second semester students. Um, I think the other thing I would just add, so our, our semester falls on January 19th, which is after the second Friday in January. So all of these students would be countered towards our enrollment on that second Friday, third Friday count in September, and a second Friday count in January. Gotcha. So That's they would be, that they will so, be counted. Out. Yes, so they will be part of our overall enrollment. Um, and then they'll be able to with their approval uh, and their successful completion of everything, um, be able to leave and, and pursue their whatever path they're taking. Um, Last thing I'll just mention is that they are also all involved and, and welcome to and know that we want them to walk across the stage. Okay. Unless there's some other type of outstanding uh, agreement that we have with them that would prohibit that, but um, we want them to participate in the graduation ceremony. Okay. All right. Anybody have any questions from you at all? If not, then I would just uh, ask your approval. <laughs> I'll move to approve the early graduation of the students um, outlined in um, the letter from Ms. Flores. Well, second. Motion by Carrie. Motion by Sarah. Or, sorry, Sarah. <laughs> by Sarah. Second by Carrie. And uh, just to <laughs> make it make it noted that uh, <laughs> I'm assuming you did already in there that uh, Ken. Can did it get arrived? Yep. Okay. You said you 
What is happening? I know, but I shut it off. <laughs> Somebody's listening all the time. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Any, any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Stuart. you. Stuart. Contract approval. <clears throat> So this is one of those situations where it occurs during the course of the month in between <coughs> board meetings. Um, I received word from um, Ms. Tina Mayer, actually from Stephanie, who received word from um, this manager that she was requesting to go to point eight and an opportunity to talk with Steph and then they talked with Clint. And so we felt given the situation that was in the best interest of the students of the district, that we move forward with that to bring it to you for your approval. So um, Steph has been working with her team to address that situation. Um, and ultimately, we still get to have Ms. Manager the 80%. So um, I can look at it and feel bad about losing her for 20% or I can feel good about we still have it for 80%. So, we're asking the board to approve her request to go from 100% to an 80% position. Continue working with their kids in the math role. Math role, that's what she said. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you say in the memo or somewhere that you figure out a way to cover the other 20% of what she's doing now? Yeah, we're, we continue to work with it. We're working on it, okay. No, is this permanent or is this? This is for this school year. This school year. Okay. That's what we know right now. Okay. Need a motion to approve? I'll make a motion to approve. Motion by Carrie. <laughs> I will second it. Second by Emily. Approve the uh, Ms. Mar Ms. Marringer at uh, point eight FTE. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. The Ohio State field trip we already covered. Sounds like you get to go on that, Ken. <laughs> Disappointing we're not coming along. Well, they gave us all the info, info on it. Yeah. Yeah. Ken needs a chaperone. All right. What was a swine tour? At first I heard something different. <laughs> <laughs> An S wine story. All right. With that, I think we're ready for closed session. <clears throat> I'll move that we consider convening in a closed session pursuant to Wisconsin Statute Section 198151E to conduct specific specified public business whenever competitive or bargaining reasons require a closed session, specifically to discuss the potential land easement purchase or land lease agreement in Wisconsin Statute Section 19.851C to consider the employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employees over which the board has jurisdiction, specifically to discuss the employment status of an administrator in consideration to a modified resignation offer. Need a second? Second. Second by Chad. Sarah, can you go ahead and do a little call, please? Jill? Yes. Trudel? Yes. Carter? Yes. Early. Yes. Baumler. Yes. Schindel. Yes. Garbrecht. Yes. Nine twenty. Nine twenty. Take a quick break. Quick fiber. That is agricultural. That is agricultural. Why do you have to turn the lights? Great. Yeah. Turn the lights. Yeah. 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 Ye